The committee will now come to order. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining today's hearing entitled Uncertainty, Inflation, Regulations, Challenges for American Agriculture. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. So once again, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the First House Committee on Agriculture hearing of the 118th Congress. Our focus this morning will be on the headwinds facing production agriculture. Without a comprehensive understanding of the industry's challenges, we cannot write an impactful farm bill that addresses the needs of those who grow, process, and consume the food, fuel, and fiber we are blessed to produce here in the United States. As we look, as we seek solutions, it is my vision that this committee will provide the necessary tools to our farmers and ranchers to ease the barriers to production felt in recent years. As chairman, I challenge each member of the Agriculture Committee to view all policies through the lens of science, technology, and innovation, and identify forward-looking solutions throughout our work. Our nation's farmers, ranchers, and foresters are exceptional, having increased food and fiber production nearly threefold since the 1940s. They've done so with no relative increase in inputs, serving as shining stars of sustainability and conservation practices. However, the uncertainty caused by a global pandemic, geopolitical unrest, and incessant government intrusion have led to a modest production decline in recent years. Enduring production agriculture policies are essential to our national security. Maintaining a safe, abundant, and affordable domestic food supply is equally essential, as is meeting the needs of the perennial global food crisis. Over the last several years, I've traveled to more than 40 states and have heard firsthand from our farmers on issues related to labor, fuel, fertilizer, inflation, and interest rates. The average cost of diesel fuel per gallon increased 95% from 2020 to 2022. The 2022 average Henry Hub Real Natural Gas spot gas price increased 53% from 2021. Fertilizer inputs such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium increased 125% in 2021, an additional 30% in the first five months of 2022 alone. Urea, the most applied nitrogen fertilizer, increased 205% in price between 2020 and 2022. Last week marked one year since Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, which perpetuates a disrupted global food su supply system uh, resulting in continued increase energy prices, fertilizer cost spikes and shortages, and worsening food scarcity in developing countries. At the same time, American consumers are watching in dismay as their grocery and energy bills skyrocket. The Biden administration continues to ignore this crisis, these crises, uh, neglecting America's producers and consumers. In fact, this administration continues to promote nonsensical regulations and policies that create needless uncertainty for farmers, ranchers, and working families, further limiting our ability to meet the growing food demands of our nation and the world. The challenges facing production agriculture are many. However, I believe that one of the few silver linings, maybe the only silver lining, is Americans' heightened awareness of the importance of a reliable domestic food supply and the producers who provide it. As members of the House Committee on Agriculture in a Farm Bill reauthor reauthorization cycle, it is our mandate to fully understand these challenges and work diligently without partisanship to ensure the passage of a strong Farm Bill that addresses the issues highlighted today. Thank you to the witnesses appearing here before us today. I look forward to your testimony. And regardless of the challenges, it is time to retire our dress shoes and put on our work boots. We have a lot of work to do, and I, I will need every one of you at the table to help us deliver a farm bill for the backbone of this country, the American producer. And before I recognize the ranking member, I, I'd like to note the additional four returning Democratic members who were added to the committee roster yesterday evening. Uh, Representatives Pengree, Carbajal, Craig, and Soto. Uh, we're, I'm excited to have all four of you back. Thank you for, for uh, your commitment to do that. Uh, and with that, I'd, I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for any opening remarks that he would like to give. Thank you. And I would like to begin my comments by congratulating Chairman 
Thompson as we start the 118th Congress and how proud I am of the bipartisan work that our Agriculture Committee did last Congress. We brought in uh, Agriculture Secretary Vilsack to discuss the state of the farm economy in January of 2022 and followed that with 19 Farm Bill review hearings with stakeholders and other administration officials. We also held five listening sessions all across the country, and we got input from farmers and consumers about how our Farm Bill programs are working for them. In addition, we have an online feedback form which is still open and can be accessed on the House Agriculture Committee's website for both Democratic and Republican feedback. And through those hearings, we have been able to get regular updates on what's happening on the ground and the needs of our farmers, ranchers, and foresters, and what we must do to make sure we get the farm bill right for all producers across the country and to ensure we are also tending to our congressional oversight responsibilities. This hearing today broadly refers to uncertainty, inflation, and regulations as the challenges producers are experiencing. And as we discuss these important issues and get input from the witnesses today, I encourage each of my, my fellow committee members, both Democrats and Republicans, to place these problems in their proper context. We are still feeling the impacts of the pandemic on our supply chains. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted manufacturing across the globe and exacerbated labor shortages right here at home. And uh, President Biden's administration has taken important actions to address these issues. For example, President Biden signed the Ocean Shipping Reform Act last year and that helped avert a nationwide rail crisis. And the president worked with us here in Congress to pass two historic pieces of legislation. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which included more than $2.9 billion for USDA's rural broadband programs for water storage and a new byproduct pilot program. And that was followed by passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which made historic investments in rural America to help our farmers and rural communities mitigate climate change and continue to lead the way on renewable energies. These investments in infrastructure in our farm bill and forestry programs will pay dividends for farmers well into the future. And we have also seen how these international conflicts continue to reverberate throughout our economy. Former President Trump's trade war with China was devastating to many American producers and domestic manufacturers. And more recently, this Russian invasion of Ukraine has had significant impacts on fertilizer, grain, and fuel costs. And ladies and gentlemen, many people may not know, but Russia at that point was containing and uh, providing 60% of all the fertilizer in the world. The cause of inflation is not singular in nature. It is the result of a variety of factors. And with that in mind, 
we should also strive to focus on the issues that are within the House Agriculture Committee's jurisdiction so that we can be the most impactful in our work ahead for our great nation in this important, vitally important to every single American, our agriculture system. I yield back and thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman. Uh, looking forward to our continuing work together here. Yes, indeed. Um, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so the witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there's ample time for questions. Uh, our, uh, let me introduce our witnesses. We have a, a, a very experienced, talented, and, and uh, diverse uh, panel of uh, witnesses today as we look at uh, you know, the landscape of which uh, uh, the American uh, producers um, have to work in today. Uh, this is a great, uh, great hearing that, uh, that to help us, guide us um, in our, our farm bill as we develop the farm bill. So our first witness today is uh, Mr. Zippy Duvall, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation. Our next witness is Mr. Peter Friedman, who is the executive director of the Agriculture Transportation Coalition. Our third witness today is Mr. Casey Rosenbush, the, the president and chief executive officer of the Fertilizer Institute. Our fourth witness today is Mr. Michael T. Twining, uh, who is the vice president of sales and marketing for Willard AgriService. And our fifth witness today is Mr. Mike Brown, president of the National Chicken Council. Our sixth and final witness today is Rob LaRue, who is the president of the National Farmers Union. Uh, thank you to all of our impressive witnesses for joining us today, and we're now going to proceed your testimony. You each have five minutes. The timer in front of you will count down to zero, at which point your time has expired, and we'd ask that you uh, wrap up uh, uh, your the, the, whatever thoughts that you're at at that point, and uh, thank you for your written testimony that you've submitted, uh, which all all members have in front of them. So, uh, uh, Mr. Duvall, please begin when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Scott from my home state and my good friend, uh, and other members of the committee. And I want to begin by thanking all of you for the work that you do for the American farmer and rancher, the country that cannot feed its people is not secure. So the strong farm policy that supports a strong food system truly is part of a smart national security strategy. There are certainly plenty of challenges for American agriculture, from losses uh, experienced in the trade war with China to the pandemic lockdowns to the supply chain disruptions. Add to that a record high supply cost, and you see how farmers and ranchers have faced unprecedented volatility in the last recent, in recent years. USDA's most recent farm sector income forecast sees uh, a decrease in net farm income in 2023, down 15.9%. Adjusted for inflation, that's 18% drop. The same report estimates that farm ranch production expenses will continue to increase by $18 billion that follows a record increase of $70 billion in 2022. Short and long-term interest rates are uh, also high and raising, rising double and triple of what it was just a year ago. And if we remember the high interest rates caused by the high inflation and Fed stopping, uh, st stepping up to, to address the inflation led to a farm debt crisis in the 80s. We need to be sure that the Doubling and tripling of interest rates does not cause a similar pressures on our, on our farmers. I am especially concerned about our beginning farmers, those that are forced to borrow for succession planning, and other farmers who have made recent uh, new investments. Affordable, reliable, abundant energy is critical to the farmers and ranchers. Energy is necessary for all farm production, and we continue to ride a roller coaster ride of high energy and in input costs. But along with the challenges, there are humongous opportunities and, uh, for, for ahead for agriculture. Innovation and research are helping us do more with less. Our advances in sustainability are, tru are truly impressive. 
But in order to seize the opportunities ahead and continue the uh, uh, achievements, we need a strong farm policy. We need to support, uh, we need this uh, supportive regulatory environment. Uh, the federal reg uh, regulations have a direct impact on farmers and ranchers. Today's farmers and ranchers fa face a flurry of uh, uh, requirements and challenges. Uh, the new waters of the U.S. rule, the Endangered Species Act, access to important crop protection tools, immigration and labor uh, regulations, and now agencies such as the SEC imposing on our farmers and ranchers new climate regulations that are meant for Wall Street. Much uncertainty remains related to the ability of farmers and ranchers to access affordable supplies and deal with the regulatory and weather-related challenges. Expected revenue decline that, uh, that has more than erased the gains that we made during 2022 so uh, it becomes more and more important for farmers to have clarity on rules that impact their business and ability to operate. Growers need to have access to comprehensive risk management uh, options. They deserve a resounding voice during uh, formulation of vital legislation such as the Farm Bill. And the Farm Bill is a critical tool that ensures our nation's food supply remains secure. Farm Bureau supports the following principles to guide development of programs in the next Farm Bill. We want to increase the baseline funding uh, uh, commitments on farm programs. We want to maintain a unified Farm Bill that includes nutrition programs and farm programs together. And we, pri and we want to prioritize the funding for risk management tools uh, that in which include both federal crop insurance and commodity programs. The 2023 Farm Bill presents an important opportunity for lawmakers to rise above partisanship. I urge you to work together again to pass legislation that protects the food security for all Americans and ensures the future access to our, for our farmers and ranchers. Farm Bill will stand against uh, the threat of long-term uh, resilience of our farm, uh, rural communities. Uh, for your part, Congress need, must protect ag uh, American agriculture and modern production pra practices from unburdened, um, uh, undue burdens. Farmers and ranchers are the highest and most trusted profession in, in America. I ask Congress to trust farmers and ranchers too and to respect the ability to innovate and solve problems. We are committed to doing the right thing and appreciate the support of this committee and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. And I look forward to the questions uh, from you in just a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vall. Appreciate it. Mr. Freeman, please begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. The timing is, is very important. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, some newspaper called the Agriculture Transportation Coalition, the principal voice of U.S. agriculture in export, Ex agriculture exporters in transportation policy, and uh, we've taken that very seriously. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to recognize a couple members of your committee who achieved more for agriculture exports when it comes to transportation than has been achieved in decades, and did it last year. Congressman Dusty Johnson and Congressman Jim Costa authorized, authored together with Congressman John Garamendi, uh, authored the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. Absolutely critical. It is essential. It has already changed the practices in ocean transportation. It has changed what the foreign ocean carriers are doing. And I want to thank you, this committee, and thank you, Congressman Johnson for, and Congressman Costa for leading the charge on that. Incredible. And uh, as uh, Congressman Scott mentioned, something about bipartisan, incredible. It passed the Senate unanimously and it passed here three times overwhelmingly. So thank you very much, really critical. Um, <clears throat> why is the transportation so important? It's because there's virtually nothing produced in agriculture or forest products in this country that cannot be sourced somewhere else in the world. If we aren't able to deliver it affordably and dependably to our foreign customers, 
Those foreign customers have other places to go. They will find substitutes, and in the past they have done so, and when they do so, it is very difficult for us, the U.S. agriculture, to get those markets back again. And there's plenty of stories in cotton and soybean and almonds and walnuts and so forth about lost foreign markets because our transportation did not facilitate the flow of affordable, dependable uh, supply. Um, so let me just say that uh, federal and, and state policies can facilitate the flow of commerce, agriculture exports, or they can hinder it. And so I'd like to highlight a couple of those. Um, now first, I want to go back to the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, because it's still very much in play. You all passed the legislation last year, but now the Federal Maritime Commission has to implement it. And those entities that were opposed to this legislation, fortunately unsuccessfully, overwhelmingly defeated, are now trying to undo some of those reforms uh, at the Federal Maritime Commission as it goes through the rulemaking process. Fortunately, the Federal Maritime Commission has five commissioners, Republicans and Democrats, that are 100% aligned and on board with the interests of agriculture exports as well as importers, exporters, all the American interests. But uh, still, the rulemaking processes sometimes provide some uh, access for those who would oppose the legislation uh, to achieve their goals down there. So we really do need this committee uh, and this Congress to continue to monitor what goes on down there, and we'll be back with very specifics from time to time as needed. Um, so that continued engagement is critical. Let me just tell you one of the things it did. The ocean carriers, foreign ocean carriers, and there are only 10 of them in the world. We're dependent on 10 ocean carriers, all foreign ca companies, to get all our agriculture products out and the inputs that much of agriculture needs into the country. Uh, they have now invested millions of dollars, which they made over the last two years, in upgrading all their systems, and it's already provided some evidence. We've seen evidence of that improvement. We do have more work to do. Truck weights need to be increased. Members of this committee are introduced the Ship It Act, which increased truck weights to a level that's even closer to what Canada and Europe and all our trading partners do. We have the lowest truck weight limits in the world in some of our states, and in California it creates a barrier to agriculture exports. The lowest truck weight limits in the world, increasing congestion, increasing delay, and increasing emissions. Uh, it's almost an embarrassment when you talk to Canadians or any other country. Uh, we need more truck drivers, and there's legislation and pilot projects underway to get more people, young people, when they graduate from high school, maybe they want to go into truck driving. They can't now. This will facilitate that. We need more uh, of that. We do need a resolution of the port uh, longshore labor uh, dispute and the contract negotiations on the West Coast that's been going too long and we're hopeful and maybe oversight from this committee will help because it's causing a shift in transportation services from the West Coast to the East and Gulf Coast. Uh, we do need inland rail depots and really can use your help there because agriculture needs more of those. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Friedman. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, Ms. Ro Ms. Rosenbush, please uh, begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. My name is Corey Rosenbush. I'm the President and CEO of the Fertilizer Institute. TFI represents companies in the entire fertilizer supply chain, from manufacturers to distributors to retailers. And we have, as an, as an industry, have recently taken center stage as the spotlight has been shined on the important role that fertilizer plays in food security. Half of all crop yields on this planet are because of fertilizer use. So I grew up in agriculture. My dad was an ag teacher and an FFA advisor. So it was actually a pleasure to spend a great part of the last year uh, with farmers. 
And I, I, uh, as the fertilizer prices began to rise in the harvest of 2021, I had a chance to climb into a, uh, a cotton picker with a farmer from my home state of Texas. And yes, as you can imagine, he was quite concerned over input costs, but at the same time, he understood that we are experiencing high, far in, high farm income and high crop prices. But not all commodities had that same bump. I'm sure you've heard that from farmers in your district. Fertilizer prices went from a period of historic lows just a few years ago to record highs. And it was really that volatility that was so impactful to the farmer. Fertilizer materials are each very different products that are all resource dependent and are all very different markets. The United States is fortunate to have significant production of nitrogen and phosphates, but we import over 80% of our potash from Canada. Globally, the United States only counts for about 7% of total fertilizer production, and over 90% of all fertilizer is actually used outside of the United States. So if you hear nothing else I say today, hear this. Fertilizer is a globally traded commodity subject to global supply and demand factors. So as we look at those global supply and demand factors, you have to start with geopolitics. We had Belarus that was sanctioned, removing about 20% of global potash supply that they produce. You had China, the world's largest producer of fertilizer, who restricted their exports. You have Russia, who's the world's largest global supplier of fertilizer, who also had sanctions from many countries as the war broke out in the Ukraine. And Russia also supplies much of Europe's natural gas. As a result, we saw nearly 70% of all European nitrogen plants shuttered during that period. Natural gas is that key feedstock for all ammonia production, but also the energy for ammonia, and that's the building block for every nitrogen fertilizer product. It counts for about 70 to 90 percent of the production cost uh, of ammonia. And we saw natural gas prices reach over $100 per MMBTU in Europe last August. Fertilizer demand is also driven by crop prices, which we have seen reach record highs. Global grain stock to use ratio, ratios are the tightest they've been in eight years, and it will likely take years to rebalance those. Logistics has been a huge issue for our industry. Over 60% of all fertilizer moves by rail, and we've seen poor rail service that was compounded by low water levels in the Mississippi River, reducing barge traffic, and of course, trucking capacity issues as well. Now, good news in recent months, for the farmer is that fertilizer prices have come down. Farmers have definitely taken a wait and see approach as we approach the summer, or sorry, the spring planting season. European, European nitrogen plants have restarted. China has slowly begun uh, exporting product. Russia trade flows have shifted and actually had a record year of exports last year. And finally, we expect market fundamentals to remain in place for the foreseeable future, with high planted acres, low grain stocks to use ratio, and high grain prices means that fertilizer demand will remain strong. So, if it's a global supply and demand issue, what can Congress do? In the interest of time, I'll refer to my written testimony where we've outlined a number of policy solutions for the administration and for Congress. But I can summarize those all by saying that fertilizer plants are capital intensive facilities, sometimes costing as much as $4 billion to build. So if one wanted to bolster fertilizer supply for the American farmer, the most significant impact that you can have to mitigate our biggest risk is to provide regulatory certainty. Thank you. Mr. Rosenbusch, thank you so much for your testimony. And and uh, now, Mr. Twining, uh, please uh, begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here to testify before you about the challenges facing American agriculture. My name is Mike Twining. I serve as Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Willard AgriService. Willard AgriService is a family-owned and operated independent retailer based just up the road in Frederick, Maryland. We service uh, growers in approximately six states with crop protection, plant nutrition, and custom application of those products, as well as robust decision support tools to help them make um, decisions in this volatile environment that are, enable them to farm more sustainably. 
I appear also before you today as a member of the Ag Retailers Association Board of Directors, of which I'm humbled to serve as the Vice Chair of their Public Policy Committee. The economic prosperity of ag retailers and the general public is directly tied to the economic prosperity of farmers. Only if they succeed do we succeed. It is therefore in our interest as well as the interest of the nation and its consumers to have a solid safety net for producers. First, I'd like to address several regulatory burdens affecting our industry. In the past couple of years, federal regulators proposed and finalized dozens of major rules that impacted many sectors, including agriculture. Due to the time limitations, I only mentioned three of them today in my oral testimony. However, many other examples are included in my written testimony. I'd like to start with EPA pesticide registrations. It's essential that the EPA have a scientifically justifiable, predictable, and functioning process for pesticide registrations. This is why we supported the PREA legislation that Congress passed last year. Uncertainty around what the rules will be and what the products will be available, including label changes too close to the start of season, complicates our efforts as ag retailers to stock the products that farmers will want and need, as well as our ability to use them safely and effectively. We commend EPA for proactively addressing the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, compliance in its pesticide reviews. However, EPA's reviews recently released ESA work plan needs additional modifications to ensure it does not cause severe disruptions to American agricultural industries. Ag retailers and their certified crop advisors, of which I am one, should be consulted in developing pesticide mitigation measures and working with those experts should be accounted for in the EPA's pick list scoring methodology. Care should be taken to provide local options that work in each growing area and cropping system because they are all unique. EPA must ensure stakeholder engagement at, of end users such as farmers, ag retailers, and pesticide applicators for the products they regulate. WOTUS, the new waters of the United States are WOTUS rule greatly expands the federal government's regulatory reach over private land use and allows EPA to regulate ditches, ephemeral drainages, and low spots on farmlands and pastures. None of these features meet the definition of the word navigable waters in the Clean Water Act, and the new rule impacts everyday activities that farmers must do on their working lands. Finally, energy, the Biden administration's focus on climate policy provides some ways that agriculture can contribute significantly to solutions, but has also created some practical problems in implementation. Natural gas, which has already been mentioned, which is an essential feedstock to manufacture nitrogen fertilizer and is a co-product of shale oil production, has seen price inc increases, leading not only to fertilizer cost increases, but volatility. Diesel fuel is used every day and is a daily necessity for every ag retailer, grain shipper, and farmer, and has increased significantly in cost. All inputs involved in the production of food have become more expensive because of these policies. The price to feed and fuel our country has risen as a result, something that every American feels on a daily basis. While my testimony this morning highlights some of the negative effects the rural economy has had on the agriculture community recently, I am encouraged by this committee's goals and prior priorities for this year. To that end, my written testimony has several recommendations for Congress and the administration to consider. As a farm supply retailer, I'm confident that improvements in safety nets in the upcoming Farm Bill, free and fair trade amongst agricultural producers and customers, and all of the above energy strategy and changes to the regulatory landscape currently hindering farm production will all contribute to a once again burgeoning farm economy. Thank you for your continued commitment to American agricultural industry, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Twining, thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Brown, please begin when you're ready. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the Agriculture Committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Mike Brown. I am the president of the National Chicken Council. Today's hearing addresses a topic that is critically important for the chicken industry, overregulation that suffocates rather than fosters a vital national industry. The chicken industry is a model of American innovation and efficiency, 
In fact, there is no more important food source in America, I'd argue the world. Chicken is healthy, sustainable, and affordable. Chicken supports millions of jobs and thousands of rural communities. But overzealous and misguided regulations threaten to take chicken off the table for millions. And those most vulnerable would be first in line. Lower income earners, children who receive free and reduced school lunch meals, and needy individuals who rely on food banks. USDA is threatening to layer on another series of unnecessary and financially ruinous regulations, and it's critical we don't repeat past mistakes. First, USDA has resurrected a 13-year-old Packers and Stockyards Act rulemaking that would stifle chicken production. Through a series of at least three rules, USDA is proposing to greatly increase the costs and legal risks involved in chicken grower contracting, make it all but impossible to incentivize high-performing farmers without bonus pay, and eliminate the need to show injury to competition. The 2010 version of these rules would have cost the industry more than one billion dollars. Today, USDA has taken a unique approach. They've taken those rules and they've broken them up into three rules. So take the billion, divide by three, that's how they're costing their rules. But 10 years ago versus today, you can imagine the cost of what it is to raise birds. So we're probably well over $1.5 billion with that particular rule. Second, USDA is suggest, suggesting it might abandon well-established program allowing chicken processors to run at certain speeds of their plants. This program dates back to the Clinton administration. It's bipartisan. Democrat administrations, Republican administrations, Democrat administrations, and here we are. And the threat to reduce line speeds could have an incredible impact, not only on the prices that consumers pay, but also the number of birds that growers can grow. And they're our most important asset, is our growers, though many of you hear differently. Uh, third, USDA has released a proposed framework that would make salmonella an adulterant in all raw poultry, an abrupt change from longstanding USDA policy and court precedent. The chicken industry has devoted tremendous efforts to controlling salmonella, and on a per-consumption basis, rates have decreased for raw chicken over the years. And as we all know, proper cooking destroys salmonella. USDA has presented no data to justify its proposal. The technology does not exist to implement a policy like this, and this policy would be inconsistent with the Poultry Products Inspection Act. But one thing is certain, treating salmonella as an adulterant in raw poultry would lead to disastrous levels of food waste, something I know that this committee and Congress and the administration take seriously. All these regulatory programs share two things in common. One, there is no compelling justification for them, and two, they would drive unprecedented levels of food inflation and food scarcity. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the chicken industry, American consumers, and farmers have faced a lot over the past several years. Chicken is the most important protein in the world. Now is not the time to be layering on additional regulations that further drain consumers, farmers, and the chicken industry. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. I know I've presented you with uh, lengthy written comments. Mr. Brown, thank you so much for both your written and your oral testimony. And now, uh, please to recognize Mr. LaRue. Please begin when you're ready. Ready. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to testify today. National Farmers Union is the nation's second largest uh, general farm organization, and we advocate for the economic prosperity of family farmers, ranchers, and their communities through education, cooperation, and legislation. As we approach the 2023 Farm Bill, we should all work together to resolve flawed regulations, mounting uncertainty, and inflationary pressures. Family farmers and ranchers are particularly vulnerable to the effects of inflation, supply chain disruptions due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, rapid shifts in demand and supply backlogs from the pandemic, and the lingering effects of trade dispute with China have all set the stage for rising costs for farmers and ranchers. These inflationary pressures are intensified by a lack of market competition in the food system. We have few buyers and sellers to choose from. As of 2019, 
The top four companies in the cattle trade controlled 85 percent of, of the market. For pork, that was 67 percent, and for broiler chickens, 53 percent. There's also heavy concentration in markets for corn and soybean seeds, herbicides, and pesticides. For tractors and other farm machinery, just three companies dominate the market. With such little competition, the opportunity for market manipulation and unfairness is greatly intensified, and this adds to inflationary pressure. For example, we've seen price fixing by meat packers and poultry integrators in recent years, with settlements totaling nearly a billion dollars. Another live saw, live, uh, sorry, lawsuit alleges the big four meat packers are manipulating the market. Major farm equipment manufacturers continue to refuse to provide us with access to the software tools to make repairs, and a mega merger between Kroger and Albertsons is expected to drive consolidation among processors, wholesalers, and distributors. We must create fairer and more competitive markets to drive innovation, increase choice, and decrease input costs and boost prices for crops and livestock. NFU believes family farmers and ranchers should be allowed to do what we do best, su sustainably produce food, feed, fiber, and fuel. Regulations when needed should be science-based, size and risk appropriate, clear, and only implemented after thorough feedback. Unfortunately, this doesn't always happen. For example, confusing regulations and court decisions regarding the definitions of waters of the U.S. have made it difficult to comply with the Clean Water Act. Clean, safe water is an essential natural resource we work hard to protect and regulators shouldn't make it so difficult for farmers to accomplish this. NFU is also concerned by a potential change in the long-standing policy on labeling of crop protection products. The change, based on a position taken by the U.S. Solicitor General in a brief to the Supreme Court, could open up the door to an impractical patchwork of labeling requirements that aren't science-based. One of the greatest sources of uncertainty farmers face is climate change. We're on the front lines of climate change with shifting weather patterns and increasingly severe weather events, making farming more unpredictable and difficult. Now more than ever, leadership on climate change is essential, which is why NFU is a proud founding member and co-chair of the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. Last week, FACA released Farm Bill recommendations aimed at helping us mitigate climate change and to make the entire farm and food system more resilient through a voluntary science and incentive-based approach. To address climate change, we should build on recent investments in Farm Bill conservation programs and renewable energy, the creation of USDA's partnerships for climate smart commodities, and passage of the growing climate Solutions Act and the Sustains Act. By working together, we can overcome the challenges presented by faulty regulations, mounting uncertainty, and inflationary pressures. NFU recently launched the Fairness for Farmers campaign to shed light on the devastating impact that monopolies and near monopolies have on family farmers, ranchers, and their communities. That's why we're calling for a competition title in the Farm Bill which should include provisions that improve transparency and price discovery in cattle markets, strengthen the Packers and Stockyards Act, ensure farmers' right to repair, reinstate mandatory country of origin labeling, and ease regulatory burdens for diversified food processing. By building fair and competitive markets, we address inflation, improve regulations, and reduce uncertainty. I look forward to working with you to address these challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Mr. Lou, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we've also received written testimony from the National Rural Lenders Association and the J.R. Simplot Company. Without objection, it will be inserted into the record. And thank you all for your important testimony today. Uh, at this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between the majority and the minority members, and in order of arrival for those who joined us after the hearing convened. You'll be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. And I recognize myself for, for five minutes. I'm uh, very proud of the production advancements our farmers, ranchers, and foresters have, have made to 
uh, you know, made thanks to science, technology, and innovation. And to put this in a global perspective, China and Brazil, both countries with comparable agriculture production levels, the United States have increased their agriculture emissions by 86% over the last 30 years, while the United States has achieved a net decrease in agriculture emissions during that same time. However, we have seen this administration attack American production agriculture and make it harder for American producers to deliver feed, fuel, and fiber to consumers across the globe. Uh, President Duvall, would, would you agree with me that, that true climate smart agriculture policies would be ones that increase agriculture production and displace the market share of countries like China and Brazil, countries with far less attractive emission profiles than the United States and who have not made the same efficiency and productivity strides as we have? I would, 100%. You can't have sustainability without having efficiencies, and doing one helps the other. Uh, we, uh, we are farmers that, uh, if you look over the last three decades, have uh, done a tremendous job in the sustainability area, and, and we are doing more with less. As a matter of fact, to produce the same crop we produced uh, last year, we would have had to have 100 million more acres cropped 30 years ago. So that's how efficient we have become, and that's how well we've been sustainable. You know, one of the leadership skills that I don't think we've, uh, actually I never recognized as a leadership skill until a couple of years ago, and that's storytelling. And American agriculture has a great story to tell. So how can U.S. agriculture do a better job of telling this story? Well, I think we do that every day uh, in, in our organizations. Uh, Mr. LaRue, LaRue, Rob, down the other end, he... He has a great organization. We do too, and we do that storytelling. But the best way for our farmers to do that is open up their farm and let uh, your staff, you, come in and visit with them to actually let them tell their story, how the farm bill has helped them through a disaster or through bad pricing times or whatever that might be, uh, and through conservation. There, there are 140 million acres that farmers have voluntarily signed up for conservation programs. And if you put that in context, that's the size of California and New York. They put their own land up voluntarily to, for conservation. And they are continuing to do that for conservation and climate smart farming. Sticking with the theme of science, technology, innovation, when it comes to meat and poultry processing line speeds, it seems USDA had the same approach until recently. Unfortunately, following a couple of lawsuits from activist labor groups, I'm afraid the department has halted all progress and is even considering reversing course. Mr. Brown, uh, do you share these concerns? And if so, is there anything that can be done to help the department get on track? Well, Mr. Chairman, as you've said, science, innovation, and technology should lead all policy decisions. Uh, and unfortunately, on this issue, it appears USDA may have lost its way. Um, we have over 25 years of experience with the increased line speeds that was begun under the HEMP program. Over the duration of that time, food safety and labor, worker safety figures have all increased, uh, not increased, decreased, but the performance has increased. The food safety profile in a line speed plant operating at the higher line speed versus the 140 line speed is equal or better than the, the, other, the other plants. Our concern is that we have 25 years of history, 25 years of data, 25 years of experience with industry and government working together. You have all the statistics at hand. Do the math, add it up USDA, and let's move forward. But no, we bring in uh, a new study, a group of folks, not necessarily friendly to the industry, from an institution in California. And now we're going to go through all those statistics again. I don't know what to expect, but I do know we have a long history of success. And finally, I'd like to add, the rest of the world operates up to at least a 30% higher than us. Uh, my chairman was in Germany last week, 220 birds a minute. Okay, How does that stack up against 140 and 175? Canada, as was mentioned earlier, much higher speeds. So we'd like to work with the committee to break through this, do the math, and move forward. 
Well, thank you very much, and that uh, is, ends my time. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Georgia, my good friend and ranking member for five minutes, Congressman Scott. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman. My first question is to my good friends, Mr. Zippy Duvall and Mr. Rob LaRoe. Now, uh, during our last Congress, we worked hard to alleviate many of the problems we're still addressing today. In the Lower Food and Fuel Act, we expanded producers' access to precision ag, uh, nutrient management tools. We improved the meat processing capacity, expanded domestic biofuels production. We reduced supply chain bottlenecks. In the Inflation Reduction Act, we injected $20 billion into Farm Bill conservation programs, $5 billion into forestry, over, one point, uh, over $13 billion into rural development. So, uh, Mr. Duvall, Mr. LaRue, how can we build on this work? What must we do to improve marketing opportunities and increase the profitability of our farmers, what must we do? Mr. Duvall, you're first. Well, I think we've got to continue the work that Secretary Vilsack has done through his Commodity Climate Smart projects and, and get that information and data back in from, from his pilot programs to see what leads us into the future. We also have to make sure that we continue to fund research and development dollars. You got to understand research and development dollars makes us more sustainable by keeping us more efficient and more competitive. And without those dollars, with other countries outspending us in that area, we could get behind. So those are two areas, but we have to make sure that we focused, and uh, uh, Mr. LaRue mentioned that they were a proud member of FACA, Food and Climate, uh, Agriculture Climate Alliance. We, were also, we are also a member of that, we, he and I, serve on that, that, that uh, committee together. Uh, and we need to make sure that anything that goes forward is voluntary, market-based, and science-driven. And if that's true, then our farmers will voluntarily step up and do the right thing like they always have done. Good point there. And now, Mr. LaRue, your thoughts? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what's already been said, but then would add that uh, really a lot of the investments that have been made um, are all about market diversification and making sure that there are greater uh, market opportunities uh, for farmers out there. And while we talk a lot about uh, the pressures that consolidation has brought uh, to agriculture and to farmers and ranchers uh, specifically and the impact it ultimately has on consumers, um, you can't just change that overnight. You've got to develop uh, new markets. You've got to create that opportunity uh, for new. So uh, investment in biofuels infrastructure is a huge thing for those rural communities and for farmers out there for uh, finding other markets. Uh, the investment in uh, more local and regional processing uh, is critical to make sure that that infrastructure is there. And so uh, in addition to that, you know, there are climate benefits from each of those. Um, and along with the Climate Smart uh, uh, partnership efforts that the uh, USDA is taking right now, I think that this will go a long way in building up that diversification that we need both family farmers and ultimately consumers. Now, Mr. LaRue, in your testimony, you made an interesting point. You talked about the tiny share of what <clears throat> of what consumers pay for food that actually goes to the farmer. Build on that. I mean, yeah, we got to get more profitability to our farmers. And uh, the tiny bit of money that they're getting after their products are sold is minuscule. So the sh farmer's share of the food dollar is something that National Farmers Union has tracked for a very long time using uh, USDA data. And what we've seen is an erosion of that share of the food dollar uh, really substantially uh, over the last several decades from uh, really a period of about 50% of the food dollar uh, to now uh, more in the neighborhood of 12 to 13 cents, depending on the product, of course. But that trend uh, continues across all food. 
uh, as a, what we're seeing um, uh, then in the larger trend is that farmers are receiving less of that food share dollar. Consumers ultimately uh, are paying more for their product out there. And so this is an education tool. What can we do about this tiny share? I think part of it is this diversified uh, market that we're talking about doing, making sure that farmers have more options in which to sell into. Those places where farmers have been able to find local and regional markets, um, uh, they get a higher share of that food dollar. Thank you very much. Now recognize uh, Chairman Locust for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I would be remiss if I didn't note that this is my first uh, hearing on the committee in four years. It's good to be home. It's just good to be home. Good and with that, in March of 2022, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission proposed a rule that expanded the scope of what climate-related information publicly traded companies must disclose to the SEC and to their investors. One part of the deeply flawed rule required companies to disclose various types of emission information. First, it, firstly, its own direct greenhouse gas emissions, otherwise known as Scope 1. Secondly, the companies were obligated to disclose the indirect emissions from all purchased electricity or other forms of energy, Scope 2. And finally, serving as a catch-all, it would compel the public company to disclose the greenhouse gas emissions from all upstream and downstream activities in its entire value chain, so-called Scope 3 emissions. I'm greatly concerned about the impact this rule will have on farmers and ranchers who serve as the starting point for many of these value chains. Uh, President Duvall, could you please speak to the potential impact and cost this rule would place on farmers and ranchers who find themselves ensnared in this broad reporting scheme? It could be tremendous. I've spoke to Chairman Gensler once and gonna to speak to him again this week about this issue, scope three, would put a heavy bookkeeping burden on our farmers. And yes, if you're a large farmer, which is 2% of the farming group, you may have the, the, the office space and the, the specialist to be able to make that documentation. But you take a middle-sized middle small farmer like myself, uh, that becomes a huge burden, and you have to hire someone to do it and have consultants help you through it. So, so it is tremendous. Uh, but I'll tell you this, as a a farmer that uh, sells my uh, cattle on free market and choose where I want to sell it to being a contract grower for a large a vertically integrated company, knowing that when things come down on that, that company, they have to deliver it. And when they have to deliver it, they turn to me to do it. And there's no one to help record it. There's no one to help to pay for it. And the, far, uh, the farmer uh, carries that burden, whether it be cattle or whether it be grain or whether it be poultry. And so it is a tremendous burden and it's, it's something that we need to stop before it gets started. Thank you, Zippy. Mr. Rosenbush, I'll start with you, but I welcome any insights the rest of the panel may have. Can you speak to the impact this rule would have on publicly traded companies who are members of your organizations? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Lucas. The, the impact on publicly traded companies um, is one thing because a lot of them are uh, already reporting a lot of their ESG um, metrics. As a matter of fact, we, we just released our sustainability report and uh, we've, we've captured uh, an increase of over 300% our emissions from um, fertilizer manufacturing. So great, great strides have been made there and I will tell you that most of those manufacturers are committed. Um, and are doing a lot of that reporting. So I think regulatory certainty, as I mentioned, is what's critical here. Um, but I think a lot of the small to medium-sized companies that are also involved in the fertilizer supply chain are the ones that we would be most concerned about. And then ultimately any of the scope three emissions that uh, Zippy referenced, I think is going to be uh, really difficult when it comes to uh, you know, these, these uh, fertilizer companies that would have to report any of that up and downstream. Anyone else care to comment on that, Mr. Brown? Uh, Mr. Lucas, while I don't have a policy on that, I'll address that under the banner of regulation. In the chicken industry alone on sustainability, over the last 10 years, we have reduced land use by 13 percent, greenhouse gas emissions by 18 percent, fossil 
fuel-based resources by 22 percent and particulate forming emissions by 22 percent, all done without the hand of a government mandate. You're saying, Mr. Now Brett? knowing that in our sustainability, I would just finish by saying, eat responsibly, choose chicken. <laughs> Clearly it shows that industry responds. You don't have to have a economic baseball bat. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair now, now recognizes Mr. McGovern for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for your testimony for being here today. And uh, Mr. Duvall and, and Mr. LaRue, it's great to see you again. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I represent a district that has over 2,000 farms in it. Most of them are small family farms. Um, and a lot of what I heard here today seems to reflect uh, the kind of the desires of bigger farms, more kind of corporate-oriented farms than the ones I represent. I mean, I, when I, some of the testimony that I've heard here and what I've read, I mean, there's calls to kind of weaken the Endangered Species Act um, to, um, to kind of go after some of the administration's uh, proposed climate actions, um, weakening of pesticide regulations by using industry science, um, and we heard about uh, the need to increase truck size and truck weights. Uh, and by the way, um, I, with all due respect, I think it's a bad idea. Um, you know, we, um, we live in the country right now with the highest road fatalities of any developed nation uh, in, in the world, and, um, uh, and the Department of Transportation has studied this and found that even a 10 percent increase in truck size and truck weights leads to less control and potentially more crashes. And by the way, the drivers of trucks don't want to see that. So I, I, I get it. Um, but a, a lot of what I hear from my farmers, um, you know, uh, refer, is related to, um, you know, um, concerns about corporate consolidation, climate risk, climate crisis. I do farm tours every year in my district. And farmers, you know, small and medium-sized farmers talk a lot about the impact that the climate crisis has had on their ability to, to grow and produce things. Um, I hear a lot about food security. Um, these are all serious topics, and I hope that this committee will, uh, will focus on them, um, similar to uh, the way we did under Chairman Scott's leadership. Um, but uh, this hearing is about uncertainty, inflation, regulations, challenges for American agriculture. And as we meet, uh, some of the uh, pandemic-related assistance in terms of food for struggling families is about to expire. Um, and it's going to be more and more difficult for families to be able to get food to put on the table. And, um, and I guess, you know, and they tell me that SNAP is not only uh, for their neighbors in need, but it is also good for these farmers and for their businesses. Uh, and so they get it. Farmers grow food that people eat. Uh, so Mr. LaRue, can you, can you please discuss the importance of SNAP to farming communities? Yeah, th thanks for the question. And first of all, I would just say that, you know, Farmers Union develops its grassroots policy positions uh, directly from our f farmer members. And uh, they renew that each year and uh, consistently have very strong uh, support for making sure that even as we are producing food, uh, that we are uh, doing everything we can to fight food insecurity. And part of the reason for that <clears throat> is because we know that uh, the uh, nutrition programs, uh, SNAP being the, the largest, um, have a huge impact not only on making sure that we're fighting food insecurity, but also driving um, uh, support and market opportunities for farmers, whether it's through fresh fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. Uh, it's also an economic driver in some of these uh, rural communities. Um, uh, in rural America, there is uh, a food insecurity issue as well. And so uh, I, I believe the statistic is that for every dollar spent uh, on SNAP, you get a dollar seventy-five in economic uh, return and activity. That goes into those uh, local uh, grocers um, and ultimately throughout the community. And, you know, I've heard criticism from some of my colleagues about nutrition programs taking up too large a portion of the farm bill. Uh, so given your expertise on these programs, can you explain how production agriculture titles work together with nu the nutrition title to help those in need and support a robust uh, farm economy? 
Well, certainly the, the Farm Bill, of course, is a food security bill, uh, first of all. And so part of that bill is designed to provide that safety net for those of us that are uh, working the land and, and producing food, whether it's through helping support conservation practices and sustainability uh, or making sure that, our, that we have a safety net on the market it's, itself. Um, on the food side, you know, making sure that there is availability and access for those who, uh, through uh, economic conditions or whatever, are in need of, of additional assistance. Too often, I, I sometimes hear the Farm Bill described as a pie chart uh, that somehow doesn't move and that as a percentage of one program increases that it might impact or decrease others. And that relative comparison just isn't the way our kind of cyclical programs work, right? One can increase or decrease without a dramatic, uh, direct impact on any other budget. Well, thank you, Mr. Duvall. Thank you for mentioning uh, the need for a strong nutrition title in the Farm Bill. I appreciate it. I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I now recognize myself for uh, five minutes. And Mr. Duvall, we, you, both from Georgia, and if you're from Georgia, you not only hear about diesel prices and, and fuel prices, but you hear about H2A a lot, especially with our, uh, spe especially crop growers. And uh, I've heard consistently from farmers in my district as they're trying to navigate all of the changes and the uncertainty about the 14% wage rate increase uh, that has, has occurred with regard to H2A. Can, can you speak to Farm Bureau's position on on all of the changes to H2A, including the wage rate and additional transparency and how that rate is actually cal calculated? Sure, Congressman. Uh, the, the AWAR, the wage rate that is handed down to farmers that have to pay uh, uh, migrant workers that are come through here through the H2A program is done by a survey. And we think that that wage rate formula is flawed. And we think we need to go back to the drawing board, look at how that wage rate is set. I mean, it, you ask any farmer, how do they set that wage? They say, you do it off some kind of survey. Well, did you get that survey? No, I didn't. So we don't know what the survey is, who gets it and who fills it out. But we think that it's very flawed. And if you look at a wage rate that, uh, that climbs faster than, uh, than, than inflation rate does, there's something wrong with that. And if you go to most of these places, those, most of these farms, uh, especially small, medium-sized farms, those people that work there, uh, whether they're migrant workers or whether they're other workers, they're part of the family. And they're taking care of those people and they're paying them a very, very fair wage and, and expecting a work out of them like we do our own families. Uh, so it is important that we find a way that we have a stable workforce, that we can bring people from other countries here, uh, not be feared uh, by, by the uh, federal, not fear the federal government and be able to contribute to our society and work uh, and have regulations that farmers and ranchers can actually abide by. The regulation piece of that is so uh, burdensome that a small, medium-sized farmer has a very difficult time being part of that, where a large farm, which is a very small percentage, might have an HR department to deal with all that, but my farm with two employees, I couldn't do that. Uh, so. We need to find that way to do that. And we need year-round workers, and we don't need to cap it because we don't know how big the problem is. M most of the farmers that I know, as, as you said, unless, unless they're extremely large farmers, use a third party, uh, which is an additional uh, oh. expense. And, and it's very complex. And, but the wage rate, uh, it moved from 1199 to 1367, if I'm not mistaken, is, that's correct. But, but housing, food, there are, there are a lot of other things that are paid for on top of the $13.67 an hour. Is that correct? That's correct. You've got to give them a place to live. That place to live is inspected. Uh, all kind of regulations that goes around that. You've you got to give them transportation. I mean, everything that, almost that you would do for a child, you have to do for an H-2A worker. Well, one other thing I want to ask you about, uh, the current reference prices with regard to the commodities. It seems to me that they weren't set when diesel prices were as high as they are and fertilizer as high as it is. Could you speak to the need to increase the reference prices to, to reduce the risk to those that are actually out there planting the crops? I will. Actually, if you look at our organization, we, we're looked at as a very conservative organization. Our voting delegates in, in Puerto Rico at our annual convention this year debated heavily whether or not to ask y'all to broaden the baseline uh, and, of course, they came down to say, 
yes, it's time to broaden the baseline because those targets that we use uh, in the, uh, the, the commodity programs and the cost that we have to go to to grow in the crop is nowhere near what it was when those targets were set. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Congressman, and, uh, and it needs to be modernized, and it needs to be a true safety net based on the cost of production today. Thank you. I'm, I'm extremely concerned about the increased risk with commodity prices where they are uh, and having the potential to fall. Once you've paid for those inputs, they're not going down. And so uh, I, I do want to mention, since this was brought up earlier, with regard to uh, the ratios on the Farm Bill, uh, my understanding with the CBO numbers is approximately 82 percent is now scheduled to go to nutrition, nutrition according to uh, CBO, and that leaves 18 percent, which gets split between conservation, crop insurance, commodities, and a couple of other things. There's actually, uh, so those ratios have changed, and they've changed significantly over, over, the, over the course of time. My time's expired, and uh, with that, I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to um, our uh, witnesses today for being here. And thank you for your service. Um, uh, Mr. LeRae, in, in your testimony, you addressed the trend of market consolation, uh, consolidation, excuse me, in farm and food systems as harming both farmers and consumers. And you share that, that grocery store numbers in the U.S. have dropped from 30 percent and large uh, mergers like the proposed merger between uh, Kroger and Albertsons contribute to higher consumer prices and fewer market options for farmers and ranchers. So can you elaborate on the impact of grocery retail consolidation on the farmers and ranchers that you represent? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, it really comes down to uh, uh, market choice and options. And the fewer there are um, and the more pressure there is uh, further down the stream, uh, that uh, uh, puts even greater pressure on uh, farmers and ranchers out there. So as we watch the uh, consolidation going on right now in the retail grocery uh, space, it's not just fewer choices and options within uh, the grocers, but then uh, those uh, few uh, who are have so much share then put pressure down on uh, processors and suppliers, um, and that then goes further down uh, to farmers and ranchers out there. This has a, uh, an ongoing impact also on the availability of, of uh, grocery stores and independent grocers out there. And certainly from, the, uh, from rural America's perspective, um, uh, it makes it even more increasingly difficult to, to have independent grocers uh, in our communities. Thank you. The, the consolidation of meatpacking plants has resulted in price fixing uh, poor returns for farmers and ranchers, and dangerous working conditions for facility employees. So can you share uh, some of the factors that have led to this problem, uh, as well as what legislation you'd like to see us address uh, issues in terms of competition and fairness? Yeah, well, uh, I hope we just say certainly Farmers Union uh, uh, was founded in 1902 at a time when we had outrageous uh, consolidation of monopolies uh, in banking and in the meat industry and everywhere. And really, the impetus for creating the original antitrust laws, which still remain on the books, uh, was to tackle that problem. And it worked for a number of years. Uh, then uh, uh, changes in the uh, 1980s uh, has led to an ever-increasing rapid uh, consolidation and mergers and, um, uh, throughout uh, agriculture and food uh, into the situation that we have today, where we have even um, less competition than we did that led to the creation of the antitrust laws. And so uh, right now we don't see anything stopping that. We need uh, greater enforcement uh, for antitrust, uh, greater oversight of uh, the marketplace right now. And so we look forward to working with Thank you. Thank you, you sir. That. Mr. Brown, uh, one of my top priorities is ensuring that black farmers, ranchers, and producers are treated equitably. So how do you respond to allegations of racial discrimination against minority uh, poultry growers and uh, is the NCC doing anything to support black farmers and to ensure that they are treated equitably? I would say a couple of things on that front. First, I'm not aware of any discrimination against uh, black farmers or any other farmers. 
I know in the state of Georgia, where Mr. Scott is, we have very diverse, very diverse growing population that in, involves uh, um, black growers, Hispanic growers, Asian growers. I know where I live in Delaware. Uh, I have three plants around me. I can't throw a baseball without hitting one of them. And I see the diversity of the growers where I am. Well, thank With you, sir. With respect to concentration, if I could just add to your question, uh, your question of Mr. LaRue, um, I hear this concentration discussion all the time. I can't speak for the other meat industries, but for chicken, we have a vested interest in our growers succeeding. We hatch the eggs, we take the birds to the farms. In many instances, it keeps farmers, particularly diversified farmers, on the farm by having additional thank, resources. Thank you, sir. I just thank want to you, get one more point in here as I follow up in terms of black farmers. Uh, so the USDA investigators determined that, that Couch Foods, a, a poultry company in Mississippi, mm -hmm. violated USDA rules and actively discriminated against black farmers. And so the original complaints were filed between 2010 and 2015, but we still have not seen justice for the affected farmers. I just wanted to put that out there, and, and if anybody has any suggestions about how we can support a fair system, that works for all growers, um, we'd like to hear. But I'm gonna share some information from my office that I have about this discrimination as it relates to black farmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the general lady. Now I recognize uh, Mr. Kelly for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the current administration continues to tout the importance of increasing meat and poultry processing capacity across the nation. However, their policies online Online speeds tells another story. Mr. Brown, if all of the poultry processing plants currently operating at higher speeds under waivers were suddenly forced to slow down their operations, what effect would it have on slaughter capacity, the supply chain, and the food security? And Mr. Duval, after he answered, I'd like for you to answer also. Thank you, Congressman. It would have a, an extraordinary impact on our industry, take out over 30% of production. Today, when you visit the meat case, the lowest cost protein and the most purchased protein is chicken. Take 30% out of production. When you come up with government regulations like this, some people pay twice. The taxpayer is going to pay for expanded government, and the same taxpayer in the grocery store is going to pay more for groceries. The other group of people that hurt, if we cut back down on production, are the people that I know we're all concerned with in this room, and I am too, growers. Fewer chickens, fewer birds placed, and the growers are put in a difficult position. So I hope we can work together. I think we all have our heart in the same spot. I would agree with Mr. Brown. I just recently uh, attend, I went and toured a facility where they were harvesting poultry. And everyone ought to go. It was mind-boggling how clean uh, and how fast and how safe it was. I was just, I, I was blown away by the, the quality of work and the quality of, uh, of the, the birds and, and how they did it and how safe it was and how clean it was. Uh, I, I come away with a whole different feeling about the processing in. But he's exactly right. You slow that down, it slows it down on my farm and it costs me money. They're not gonna pay me because it's late leaving. They're not gonna pay me if it sets on, before it gets to scales and loses weight before it, they're not gonna pay me. It's gonna cost farmers themselves money. And if we have the data, and they say they do, I don't have the data, uh, of the safety and the speeds and how it works together, uh, I think we ought to go by that data and sound science. Thank you, Mr. Duval. And Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the balance of my time to Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Duval, if I may. <clears throat> I hear a lot of feedback from our farmers and ranchers in Nebraska on the waters of the U.S. Can you give uh, your position and the negative impacts of water of the U.S. to the uh, farmers and our ranchers? Yes, sir. Uh, the the uh, waters of the U.S. rule is the largest land grab of the, land grab of the federal government in history. And uh, uh, if you look at how that rule has uh, move from, uh, from administration to administration. Our farmers feel like a ping pong ball going back and forth from one side of the table to the other, not being able to make long-term decisions based on what evidence we have. This new rule that came out in December uh, put, it 
it took it from a rule that was clear that we could understand to making it just muddy as muddy water. Uh, we can't, right now, we don't know what an ephemeral stream is, whether or not it's a navigable water or whether it's a, 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 a significant nexus. So uh, we're waiting on the, uh, the Supreme Court to rule on the second case, hoping it gives us clarity so that we can get a rule that is uh, clear uh, so that we can provide clean water like we always do because water is a resource that is on our farms and some of them have been there for generations. And the last thing we want to do is hurt the natural resources on our farm because our families live on it and drink the water. Uh, and we want to have a clear rule to make sure we know how to abide by it. Thank you for your perspective. Uh, a follow-up question, but on trade with you, Mr. Duvall, is China meeting its trade requirements or agreements that were stated under the previous administration? Are we holding our feet to the fire? Could you repeat that again? Is China meeting its trade agreements that they made with the previous administration? Do we need to be doing more to hold their feet to the fire? You know, the phase one trade agreement was huge for agriculture. Uh, and did they meet it totally? No, and they didn't meet it in the, in the second year of it. Uh, but that trade agreement uh, was really uh, helpful to our farmers and ranchers and, 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 and put us in that market to be able to sell to them. And, and we need more trade agreements like that, but we need to hold their feet to the fire, just like we need to hold Mexico's feet to the fire when it comes to biotech and their discussion around not taking our corn. Mr. Rosenbush, you know, the herbicides, pesticides, our fertilizers were tripled or quadrupled in cost. Has it gotten, has it become better for the, our farmers right now in this area? And what can we do to do better? Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for that, Congressman Bacon. And, and um, you know, as I mentioned in the testimony, we have seen a softening in the market uh, recently. So prices have come down, in some cases, half the cost of what they were last year. Uh, several reasons for that. One, I think farmers are waiting and uh, wait and see approach. And so that softened the market a little. But some of the global markets, as I referenced, have also opened back up. So you see a lot more product moving that uh, impacts that, that supply and demand all over the world, whether it's India or, or Brazil. So I think going into the spring, that wait and see approach has impacted where we are today. Um, but I think long term, we also have to just look at what that global stock to use ratio is and the fact that we still need to be planting acres and crop prices are still going to, to be high. And so that's going to lead to more demand. So that volatility has been what's been most impactful. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thanks. Can I make a quick statement that we may wait around, but when it comes time, you got to put that fertilizer out. It, you, if you do, don't, you miss the window and you're less productive. Good point. Time, all time has expired. Uh, now I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman who uh, uh, really helped us host a, uh, a great listening session in the Central Valley uh, in uh, California. Yeah. California. Uh, Mr. Cost for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. And it was a good listening session that uh, we had uh, with the uh, uh, committee and those members that were able to attend, I think uh, we uh, were able to to pick up a great deal of information. Um, you know, I, I think when we look at uh, today's topic on uncertainty, regulations, and inflation impacting the farm country, uh, I'm reminded of the fact of a third generation farmer that, uh, you know, the ebb and flow uh, over over decades, certainly uncertainty is always a question. and. And there and change is constant in, in farming, for sure. Um, the regulatory structure, uh, I think, continues to be challenging. And it varies from region to region, state to state, as well as on the federal level. Um, and, um, it, but it's important that we uh, raise these issues and we hear from leading agricultural organizations about the impacts on the farm country. because representing a very significant farm area in California and a third generation farmer, I, I understand and hear these uh, every day. And I remind people two things. One, food is a national security issue. It's a national security issue. Uh, and I think maybe with the impact, sadly, of the uh, pandemic, people, when they saw shortages on shelves, maybe began to understand that the food that they enjoy every night uh, um, 
you know, uh, may come from a grocery store or from their favorite restaurant, but it, that's where they get it. That's not where it comes from. Uh, it's hardworking farmers, ranchers, dairymen and women, and farm workers that frankly put that food on America's dinner table every night. The second thing I think is important for the purpose of this hearing is, and I say this all the time, going back to my years in Sacramento, farmers are um, uh, price uh, takers, not price makers. And people think, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you put all those input costs throughout a year into your crop. Uh, and, and so you're, at the end of the year, you may have X in, invested in that crop, uh, but the price that you're getting is Y. And you can say, well, I can't make it with Y because I lose money. I need it. I need something else. Well, the fact of the matter is you're a price taker. You don't have the ability to set the price for your inputs. And that's important to note when we think about the farm bill this year and the safety net that it provides for American farmers and ranchers and, and also for the nutrition programs as well. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, many of you have mentioned the importance of the nutrition programs. One of the things we haven't talked about in terms of the security and the impacts we've seen under the regulatory and, and supply chain effort is the impacts that we've seen when the, uh, our, our food supply chain was turned upside down. It resulted in a bipartisan effort in the Ocean Shipping and Reform Act, which uh, Congressman Johnson and I and Garamendi uh, moved forward. It was implemented, uh, uh, signed into law and implemented now. Uh, and, and we're looking at uh, this critical piece of legislation. Mr. Friedman, I'd like to thank you for your participation in this. Can you explain the impacts of holding global shippers accountable so that we can stabilize the input for prices, getting back to price takers and price makers? You know, one of the key things is uh, in California, 44% of our agriculture is exported. And so this had a, a real havoc in, in terms of our ability to export and our prices. Could you please comment? Uh, thank you, Congressman uh, Costa. I began my testimony by uh, thanking our heroes here, uh, Congressman Johnson and yourself uh, God bless you. in this committee for, for accomplishing probably the, the greatest uh, benefit for U.S. agriculture in foreign markets that has been accomplished in at least two and a half decades here with the Ocean Shipping Reform Act last year. It kept the U.S. and it will keep the U.S. exporters in the foreign markets. And if I could say this, I've heard from many members that, well, I represent small farmers and they don't export or they sell to producers or brokers. How does this impact them? Guess what? During the pandemic, as, as you know, uh, because some of your constituents were unable to get the products exported to the foreign market. They couldn't get it on the ships. What happens to that market product? It just gets dumped onto the U.S. market, and that's the market that the smaller right. companies that don't and, export. And, and we had markets, but we couldn't get a consignment to put the product on the ship to, to get it to market. Quickly, uh, we're looking at reintroducing uh, the Ocean Shipping Antitrust Enforcement Act. How do you think that could help out? And uh, I think it can help out by uh, recognizing the consolidation that has been spoken about today in ocean shipping. There are now 10 ocean carriers left in the world, and they're consolidating further into those three alliances. And, uh, you know, if, if we don't have an ability in the U.S. government, which we do not now under current law <clears throat> have the ability to review those proposed consolidations before they happen. They're going to just continue, and pretty soon we're going to be down to no competition yeah. uh, for the U.S. export commerce. Well, thank you. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. This is something that I think we need to work on in, in addition to the Farm Bill this year, and uh, I look forward to our continued effort. Well, I thank the gentleman, all part of the agriculture supply chain. Uh, uh, please recognize uh, the uh, gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann, for five minutes. <coughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Chairman Thompson, for having this important hearing and to all of our witnesses that are here today. I represent the big first district of Kansas. Um, last week, I had 15 town halls all over western Kansas where farmers, ranchers, and, and ag producers um, told me last week, like they've been saying for the last two years, that their businesses and livelihoods have been very impacted by increased input cost and overburdensome regulations. 
on top of all this, we're in a major drought uh, throughout western Kansas and, and really um, throughout the Great Plains in this country. From 2000 to 2020, the average annual rate of inflation was 2.1% which economists consider a normal rate of inflation that helps drive overall economic growth. Uh, the, in 2022, input prices skyrocketed, and we saw the largest December to December percentage change since 1981, when everyone in this room uh, knows full well the farm economy then crashed, due in part to surging inflation. Unfortunately, 2023 does not look much more promising on the input side of the equation. USDA anticipates the production costs will increase this year to a record $500 billion. My question uh, is for you, uh, President Duvall. Does the current farm safety net provide adequate risk management to cover <coughs> these expenses and reflect the risks that our ag producers truly have uh, in modern day production agriculture? No, it doesn't. It needs to be modernized. It needs to be studied and, and reflect the true cost of production uh, as of today. I, I wholeheartedly agree, which is why farm bills are five-year bills to be updated with the times. Um, incredibly important. And, and that's why painfully our members ask for the uh, baseline to be broadened. Yep, yep. Um, at a time when inflation is at a 40-year high, Congress should be working to eliminate barriers for the ag sector, not hamstringing our hardworking Americans with government overreach. Given all of this, I'm concerned especially with the Biden administration's rulemaking under the Packers and Stockyards Act including their proposed rules on transparency, inclusive competition, and market integrity. USDA has stated that it is its intent to clarify that parties do not need to demonstrate harm to competition in order to bring an action under Section 202A and 202B of the Packers and Stockyard Act. These rules, if finalized, would profoundly alter the operation of American protein markets and have devastating impacts on the quality efficiency and innovation of American animal agriculture. Producers would lose the ability to reap the financial rewards of their superior performance and product, and consumers will be saddled with higher costs for lower quality products. These rules, in my view, are an egregious example of regulatory overreach, which will harm producers and consumers. Mr. Brown, if finalized, what effect do you see that these rules will have on the quality of animal protein available to consumers at restaurants and grocery stores across the country? Thank you for your question. I think I could sum, sum it up in one sentence. Basically, what these rules would do is turn any interaction between a processor and a grower into a litigation flashpoint. It's going to add cost, and uh, at the end of the day, it's not going to help our growers. Yep, I, I agree. And at the end of the day, consumers going to lose as well because they're going to be paying more uh, for a lower quality product. Right. The cons and back to a point I made earlier, you expand the government, taxpayers got to pay for it, and then they get to pay for it again when they go down to their grocery store. Yep, yep. Um, I'm also concerned with the EPA's recent proposed revisions to the interim decisions for atrazine, an important herbicide that corn and sorghum growers in my district and, and across America rely on to increase yields and implement conservation practices. The decision included a pick list of mitigation measures that EPA developed without feedback from USDA that producers would be required to implement when using atrazine. While I understand that the USDA does not have final say in the regulation of crop protection pools, I believe that EPA can benefit from the ag expertise of scientists and staff at the USDA. A uh, question for, for Mr. Twining, how can the EPA and USDA work together to ensure producers continue to have access to the tools um, that they rely on in modern day production agriculture. Thank you, Congressman Mann. I'd, I would say just in general, uh, everybody's got opinions. I'd like to live in a world of facts. And the USDA has several subject matter experts that understand the practical implications of regulation and pesticide management. Currently, my understanding is there is no direct requirement for EPA to coordinate with USDA and when it comes to developing things like mitigation uh, matters. So we would support um, that requirement and a formal connection between the USDA Office of Pest, uh, Pest Management and EPA to make better logical uh, rules. Yeah, I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. No, I thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize the gentlewoman for Virginia, 
Uh, Ms. Spanberger for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just with the Farm Bureau in Virginia, in Madison County, where I held a roundtable with many of the producers from our district. Um, and so I just want to thank all of the organizations here present uh, for the work that they do in advocating. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Brown because among the things that we talked about was the highly pathogenic avian influenza, the impact that that has had on the poultry producers in my district. Uh, certainly we know in the grocery store on the cost of eggs, the death of birds, and frankly the, the dire issue it creates uh, for producers and families. Um, and importantly for the veterinarians who are trying to deal with this outbreak, uh, there were discussions related to the shortage of penicillin and I would love to follow up with that on that topic in the future uh, so that we can make sure that we are strengthening our ability to fight back um, against any type of illness that might be impacting our animals um, uh, in the future. Mr. Duval, I really want to thank you for your discussion and in, in, in your opening remarks talking about the national security implications of a country that can't feed itself. As a former intelligence officer, certainly uh, that is central to uh, my view of our work in supporting uh, Virginia's agriculture, but certainly agriculture across the country. And Mr. Friedman, uh, your discussion about the transportation implement, uh, impacts, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, which I was proud to support, um, and, and also the challenges that we're facing uh, because of changes in the trucking industry and aging workforce. Uh, these are all issues that I continue to focus on because the producers in my district say that it matters to them, and certainly we see that trend uh, nationwide. I, I'm grateful to my colleague, Ms. Adams, um, and Mr. LaRue for talking about consolidation uh, within uh, the meatpacking industry and the enforcement of antitrust uh, laws that exist on the books. And I'm also really proud that we've seen localized uh, processors and, and Mr. Johnson has been a partner uh, with me working to make sure that we can have local uh, processing facilities. Certainly we've got one uh, getting built out in my district that's really gonna matter to our growers. Um, but my next question, well, my first question, actually, uh, is aimed at Mr. LaRue. So I, I really want to thank you for highlighting uh, an issue that I know impacts many of the producers I represent, and that's senseless restrictions and barriers that prevent, prevent them from repairing their own equipment. I've been working closely with Senator Tester on this issue and uh, hope to be introducing legislation in the House that would ensure that farmers have the tools necessary to repair their own equipment. Uh, farmers should not be held ransom by big corporations when it comes to the literal tools of their trade. Uh, so could you just talk about uh, some of the current legal barriers and liabilities that face farmers who try to fix their own equipment that they own um, or that uh, have to rely on a third party to do so? Yeah, I think it's a pretty shocking issue for a lot of folks who aren't familiar with it that, you know, if for some reason you went to take your car, or your pickup, um, and you weren't allowed to take it to the shop there in town, uh, but you had to take it to the dealer, um, if you weren't allowed to uh, work on it yourself. Um, and so uh, the auto industry actually took care of this uh, a number of years ago, but in farm equipment, uh, Certainly with the adoption of additional technology, farmers are currently, for many procedures, un uh, not allowed to uh, touch, uh, to access uh, the codes to uh, fix their own equipment or to get any independent. Um, uh, uh, this drives up cost of that. It uh, impacts harvest, uh, for example. If uh, you have... Uh, Harvesters broken down and you can't get uh, your miles from uh, anybody to get that repair. So, Because you have to wait for somebody to come who's allowed to come and fix it. Absolutely. You've got to wait for, for that. somebody to actually have the sensor to be able mm -hmm. to show what is actually wrong with this. This uh, barrier, uh, we've had promises in the past uh, from the equipment manufacturers that they will allow access to this information and allow some um, uh, independent repair. Uh, that, however, uh, did not come through. Uh, so we, we need to see uh, laws in the books to enforce that right to repair. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Duval, in the limited time I have left, um, can you just speak to the importance of maintaining the high funding levels for the conservation title in the Farm Bill? Um, how do you see continued access from year to year to voluntary, and I stress that point, voluntary conservation programs that help farmers and producers, certainly like they do in my district? Um, how does that provide them with certainty for their bottom line? Sure. Uh, you know, as our society moves more and more toward 
uh, discussion around climate. There's going to be more asked of farmers and ranchers, and to do that, we got to have voluntary programs that we can volunteer for and have have uh, have participation from everyone to help us put that uh, on the ground. Uh, so it's important. And if you look at the history of the programs that's there uh, in conservation, they've been sorely underfunded uh, and highly uh, the applications for it are, are out the ceiling. And hopefully, we'll have the funding to be able. To, to be able to put those practices on the ground. And then the next problem is, is the technical support in USDA to help our farmers put it on the ground. That's a very uh, interesting thing that everybody needs to be aware of. A huge issue. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back. I thank the General Lee. Now, please recognize the gentleman from the rice and duck capital of the world, <laughs> Mr. Crawford, for five minutes. Thank you. I wish you'd had better luck when you were there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm concerned about the administration's rulemakings under the Packers and Stockyards Act and that I think it would have negative effects on the cost and quality of protein products for U.S. consumers and that USDA is, in fact, overstepping their authority in making these rules. Congress last spoke to this issue in 2008 Farm Bill and again blocked, it, uh, blocked USDA from making similar rules from 2012 to 2015. In its latest attempt to circumvent the will of Congress, USDA has taken the unusual step of breaking their proposals up into four distinct parts, which will obscure the true economic impact of their proposal and make it difficult for affected stakeholders to accurately assess the full implications of their proposed changes. Last September, my Republican colleagues and I, on this committee, sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack warning him that these rulemakings likely violate the major questions doctrine. And despite the Secretary's outlined response, my concerns remain today and will going forward. Switching gears a little bit, um, Mr. Twining, in your testimony, you mentioned free and fair trade among ag producers and, cons and, and customers. And I would argue that free and fair trade are not necessarily the same thing. But for the purposes of our conversation, can you help us identify any duties and tariffs that have impacted the price of fertilizer? Well, yes, yes, Mr. Congressman. Um, most recently, and it's important to understand, uh, our particular business operates on the coast. The supply chains for the coastal regions of the, ag of the U.S. are very different than for the central parts of the country. We're much more dependent upon ocean trade and imported products to support our farmers, and a lot of the domestic production cannot reach us. Uh, most recently, there was a proposed tariff on UAN unique, uh, solution, which is the nitrogen source our growers use. Fortunately, it was not approved, but that type of tariff would have been very detrimental to the competitiveness both of American agriculture in general, as well as the viability of, of producers on both coasts of the country. So there was a tariff proposed? And who, who pros, proposed that tariff? Uh, CF Industries, I believe, proposed that tariff. Okay. Um, we've, seen, we've seen this administration impose and release tariffs on, on uh, fertilizer from both Morocco and Trinidad and Tobago. We need to, I think we need to look at farmers' input costs uh, from the fair trade perspective to give producers the lowest possible input costs available. Mr. Rosenbush, uh, in light of your industry's record profits, um, what are the intentions of the industry uh, with regard to address uh, the critical needs that the U.S. producers have dealing with record high input costs for domestic producers? Yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman Crawford, and uh, your expertise on fertilizer is always appreciated. <laughs> I, um, I would say that we live in a globally you know, uh, uh, traded commodity. We live. In, we are a globally traded commodity that relies a lot on supply and demand. And so, as we think about what's going on geopolitically with Russia, with Belarus, with China, um, all of those, as you mentioned, and trade restrictions that China has put um, on some of their exports have an impact on the farmer right here uh, in the United States. So. It also, uh, you know, from a free market perspective, you're, you're going to see price setters such as Europe, which is the marginal producer right now with high natural gas costs, costs that's going to drive up that cost of fertilizer right here for uh, United States farmers. And furthermore, I would say that uh, if you think about, you know, it's hard to put fertilizer all in one category, but generally speaking, the American farmer actually, um, you know, has fertilizer available at a discount compared to a lot of uh, the competitive farmers in Brazil or Africa or other places. So 
you know, I think ultimately looking at opportunities to expand production and capacity is definitely on the agenda. I think that some of the regulations and the permitting challenges that we face restrict some of that. And so whatever this administration and Congress can do to help bolster that supply would be terrific. We had one member that runs a phosphate mine spent 10 years already and $32 million to expand phosphate production. So that kind of assistant would help ensure we have more nutrients available. Thank you. And real quick, switching gears as a farm bill year, Mr. Duvall, it's becoming abundantly clear that we'll need to make a push to increase PLC reference prices. Give me a, give me a good reason why it's, it's, it's food security, it's national security. Why do you believe it's so important that we address that PLC reference price? Well, just like the nutrition pro program is a safety net for people that in this country that need help at that point in time, when farmers go through a disaster of some kind, whether it be weather or whether it be prices or whatever it might be, that safety net needs to be strong and it does not reflect today's cost of production. Appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Now, please recognize a gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feenstra, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a really important. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up my order. My, my apologies. And now, please represent that. We'll get back to you, Randy, I promise you. And we'll let you start from the very beginning, too. You get the full five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> please recognize the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Brown, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott for holding this hearing today. And uh, thank you to our expert panel for being here. Your perspectives are helpful as we look ahead to the next Farm Bill. Um, over the past few years, our nation has faced a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, historic weather disasters exasperated by uh, the climate crisis, and challenging trade wars, all of which have contributed to rising costs throughout our food chain supply. On the front end of the supply chain, farmers are facing record high input costs and production expenses only to face a market that is increasingly volatile and uncertain. So this question, gentlemen, is for Mr. LaRue. Um, in your opinion, what are the biggest contributing factors to the instability farmers are facing in the market today? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to quickly think about how to sum it up because uh, there are uh, enormous uh, uh, challenges uh, that uh, that face farmers, and fa as farmers, we're used to uh, volatility. We're used to uncertainty uh, in a lot of ways. But uh, as you well point out, right now, uh, that is being exasperated by uh, uh, climate change. It's being exasperated by uh, pandemic and supply chain disruptions. Um, I, I might just say that one of the biggest challenges that we're facing that we're having to come to bear uh, with right now is that the pandemic in particular showed that while we have a very efficient food system, uh, the envy of the world in many ways, and certainly the safest, um, what we don't have is a resilient food system. And that ultimately impacts farmers very directly and consumers because the more that we can spread out uh, process and create market opportunities, that's much better for farmers, it's better for those rural communities, and then that ultimately feeds all the way back up to uh, better opportunities for consumers on the other end. Well, thank you for that. Um, and furthermore, underserved producers, including black farmers and other producers of color, have been particularly hard hit by the impacts of inflation on input and other costs. Um, so to Mr. LaRue and any other witness who would like to jump in, can you describe actions taken by this administration to aid underserved producers and whether you have any suggestions of things we should explore in terms of risk management to enhance the availability and accessibility of programs for underserved producers? Yeah, it's important, and certainly this administration has taken a hard look at it. I think time will tell what the impacts of that are, but they certainly have tried to, uh, through some of the programs and funding that they have issued, really taking a focus on making sure that those who are underserved, uh, those who have been historically uh, uh, ha lack of access, whether it's capital uh, uh, or any access to any of the uh, programs. Uh, so I think that this uh, ongoing focus, whether it's as we looked ahead to the next Farm Bill or any proposals that we're looking at, uh, this question of equity uh, and inclusion is going to be uh, an important one. It's one that uh, we made reference earlier to uh, Mr. Duvall down there and the Farm Bureau along with uh, many other organizations through the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. Those recommendations um, had the uh, very 
uh, important input of the Federation of Southern Co-ops, making sure that equity and access to capital and access to these uh, climate smart uh, programs are available to everyone. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Duvall? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, uh, the things of the past, they should not ever happen again. And we need to make sure that USDA, our organizations, and everyone, uh, our outreach needs to be better. We have uh, just recently, in the last three or four years, reached out to Manners, uh, a, uh, AFA, and other youth organizations to make all youth uh, from, from, from all parts of life to be aware of what they can participate in our organization, give them information as to what agriculture holds for them, where their place could be, and give them the opportunity to know what programs are out there, whether it be through USDA or some other places that they could take advantage of to become and be more involved in agriculture. There are more jobs in agriculture than there are graduates wanting them. And there's no reason for anybody to be discriminated against because we need all those brilliant minds regardless of where they come from. And we need them now. Because looking at the future of our food production and talking about it being national security is, of the, of, uh, is at an emergency level that we, we find out how we make agriculture attractive to young, intelligent minds. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, while we talk about inflation, uncertainty, and the rising costs on the front end of the supply chain, I would be remiss not to mention the same inflation and uncertainty is hitting families on the opposite end of the food supply chain in the form of high prices at the grocery store. So while we're discussing mitigating ways to alleviate the farmer's pain, we must also discuss how to assist families, particularly those who have fallen on hard times, in the form of protecting and strengthening our SNAP program. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, I thank the general lady, and uh, and inflation definitely doesn't discriminate. There's no doubt about it. It's a heavy weight on everyone. Uh, now I'm pleased once again recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feinster, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott. Uh, I want to thank our panel of witnesses. Uh, it was impressive to not only hear your testimony, to read your testimony. Uh, this is serious times. And uh, I am excited to be on the Ag Committee to, to work on the Farm Bill with the Chairman and with the colleagues on this committee. Uh, we have a, an important task to do. Uh, but we also have other tasks uh, related to the topic of the day, of, of the situations of inflation and regulations and uncertainty that's really affecting uh, our, our farmers, our producers, and uh, our families and small businesses. Because of inflation, because of the high costs of, of inputs, that obviously is raising, raising commodity costs, that obviously raises food costs. It all goes together. Um, traveling my, my uh, 36 counties, I have the second largest ag producing uh, district in, in, the, in the country, and I have heard from my farmers and, and local leaders about the hardships they're facing when it comes to accessing capital and, and dealing with the burdensome, burdensome regulations. So, Mr. Duvall, I want to uh, talk to you about one of the biggest challenges that I've heard is uh, farmers facing affordable access to capital, meaning that over the last uh, uh, year and a half, we've seen interest rate dramatically climb, doubled, uh, more than doubled. And we see the feds now saying, hey, we're not tamping down inflation, that inflation is still rising at an alarming rate, obviously highest in four decades. This really affects farmers because now they're trying to get a credit line uh, either to buy livestock or to put in their, their crop this spring, and yet banks are going, wait a minute, this is your interest rate. I mean, th this is a real problem. I was wondering if you could address that and how it stifles uh, production and then also how it stifles new precision ag technologies for getting on the market to create more efficiency. Yeah, uh, of course, and thank you for the question. Uh, Availability of credit is, is crucial to agriculture. Well, not just when you get into the business, but we, you know, we have a medium-sized farm that might borrow a million dollars to put a crop in the ground. Who in the world does that? Right. Knowing that we got to depend on rain and all the elements and what might happen to do that. And of course, the banks are trying to be protective of the assets that they capital they loan us. But uh, that's why the programs are so important. 
It gives a foundation and a safety net, not just for farmers, but for lending institutions, of uh, people that buy the food at the grocery store, and everyone. That's why it's so important. It does stifle technology, and technology is what keeps us efficient, sustainable, and on the cutting edge and competitive to the world. Well, th thank you for those comments, and you nailed it. And this is why when we have inflation and we have interest rates growing at a fast rate, it is just crushing our, our farming community and how we want to create you know, more efficiencies and more effect effectiveness. We can't because of the cost of interest. Mr. Uh, Mr. I, I farmed yeah. during the 80s. Yes. And I remember going in when we didn't have 24-hour news, and there was some farmer that was upside down on the news that had hurt himself or someone. That's right. Because of the stress he was under. Yep. It, uh, interest rates are crushing. Yes. And our young farmers, uh, whoever they might be, yep. are, are going to feel the blunt of that worse than they've ever seen before if it continues to rise. I agree 100%. And there's no end in sight right now. And the feds have said this, that they don't know where their this rate increases are going to end. Uh, Mr. Twining, I got a quick question for you. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing from, from my 36 counties and ag people is obviously the waters of the U.S. and the unprecedented uh, ruling that came down from the EPA where they doubled down on expanding the significant nexus test on navigatable waters. And you think through what this actually does. I mean, I think about being a farmer and, and all of a sudden you have water in your creek or your pond or, 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 or coming out of one of your tiles and now all of a sudden is, is regulated by the EPA. I mean, frankly, whether it be plowing, uh, moving a fence, putting in a fence, it is all now under the jurisdiction of the EPA. Uh, which, in essence, could fine them if, if, if not done correctly or if they didn't get a permit. Again, not even thinking about it, the farmers would have to get a permit if, if this is actually the case. Can you explain further to me uh, how this is truly detrimental to our farming community and how our farmers probably know best? Yes, sir. Um, so we deal with growers from 20 acres to 12,000 acres as an ag retailer, and we're on their operations every day. And you to not have the certainty that you can perform any type of operation, whether that's an application of a pest control product or a plant nutrition product or to do something as simple as plant or harvest a crop based on whether or not we got a big rain the night before. That's right. uh, uh, and to not have that clear definition creates tremendous uncertainty that really just paralyzes our ability to do business and to produce food in an efficient manner. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate your comments and thank you. I'm out of time, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and now please recognize the gentlelady from Colorado, uh, Congresswoman Caraveo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to you and to Ranking Member Scott for hosting this um, hearing today. Um, and um, to the witnesses, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to be participating in my first Agriculture Committee hearing, and I'm glad that it's on this very important topic um, on the challenges of our agriculture producers and what they're facing. Uh, I represent three of the largest ag producing counties in Colorado, including Weld County, which is actually the largest ag producing county outside of California. Uh, my ongoing conversations with farmers and ranchers reflect the real concern heard here today on high costs, weather, and climate uncertainties. Um, Colorado farmers actually recently saw our state house approve a consumer right to repair equipment act. So thank you um, to Mr. LaRue for your comments earlier. Um, what the law there in Colorado would do is require manufacturers to provide parts, software, and tools to independent repair providers and equipment owners. And so um, I think that this is also a very important topic that we need to take on at the federal level. Um, I know that in my family, when we're talking about repairing things, what my niece always tells my dad as he's fixing his truck or, or something around the house is, abuelo, just Google it. Um, and, um, and that requires broadband um, access, something that I know in parts of Colorado is, is very difficult, um, uh, especially for beginning and small family farmers and ranchers um, to, they have to you know, take on the cost of broadband on top of inflation. So Mr. LaRue and Mr. Duvall, um, I would love to hear you talk about the importance of affordable broadband being available to rural communities, especially for our farmers um, and ranchers? It's, it's critical. You've heard one of the themes that's been mentioned uh, several times here about uh, farmers' ability to innovate, right, and to get creative, whether it's Googling or, uh, you know, a new wet, uh, repair or something. But the, um, uh, that requires access to that technology. It requires the ability to uh, to, to 
communicate and whether it's uh, high-end uh, equipment out there that's connected um, or whether it's uh, your family trying to uh, make sure that you can have an all-farm job, if you will, uh, in order to cover health insurance. You know, how many, we haven't even talked about this issue today, but so many farm families have someone that works off the farm uh, because of the challenges that we're talking about, because of those thin margins uh, that are out there, and because of the lack of affordable uh, health insurance in some cases. So that uh, all-farm income or kids coming back to the farm uh, is made much more uh, accessible when there's high-speed uh, internet. Personally, when I'm at the farm in very rural West Virginia, just across the Allegheny Mountains and south of here, um, if I want to be able to have a Zoom call, just a simple Zoom call with somebody, I have to drive 25 minutes uh, to the truck stop, sit in the parking lot, and have that conversation, and then get back to the farm. That's not efficient, and that's not a way to move things forward. Mr. He's telling the truth. I've seen him sitting in there. Because <laughs> we have a lot of Zooms together. Uh, you're exactly right. You know, and, and as we talk about society thinking more about climate, all that new technology is going to require us to have broadband. And without that broadband, small, medium size, what, 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 regardless what size you are, you're not going to be, it was not going to be available to you. You're not going to be able to use it. Collecting data. You know, data is... Who knows what it's going to be worth to the farmer because he owns all that data on his crops and his tractors and everything. That, and, and what that's going to be worth to him someday, we don't have a clue what that is. But without broadband, we can't collect all that and be able to store it and do the right things. You know, and just as important is, is, is cell phone service. Farmers live a lonely life, a lot of times miles and miles and miles from anyone. And just to have the security of having something you can contact somebody in case something happens. And our business is uh, only second to mining being the most dangerous business in the country. So uh, there, there's a lot, a lot of reasons. But this is the one I don't want everybody to forget. Our rural communities are drying up and going away. And our young people go to college where they have great internet and they learn all these wonderful things. We're moving toward a society that more people are working from home. We want those young people to go home and work from home, but they're not going to be able to do it without good broadband service. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady. Now, please recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Finstead, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, for having this important hearing today. And to each and every one of you up there, thank you so much for being here and the work that you do uh, for the uh, greatest population of folks in this country, and that's our farmers. I, uh, I'm a proud fourth generation farmer myself. I like to tell people I grow corn, soybeans, and kids. So I'm raising the fifth generation, and uh, President Duvall, you, uh, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head in regards to you know, just engaging and bringing back youth to the farm. And I joke quite often about how technology and how we have to embrace it, and this conversation that we just had here in regards to the broadband and connectivity in rural America uh, my dad said he was going to retire from farming when the tractor drove itself. We got auto steer. Sure enough, he retired. My son plants corn with an iPad. So that technology and that ability to connect uh, is so important to, uh, you know, strengthening rural America. So thank you for, for your comments on that. Uh, but make no mistake, farm country is facing several challenges, including increased input cost to the supply chain, uh, increased uh, input cost, the supply chain's chain uh, challenges, interest rates, uh, and burden, burdensome regulations passed down by bureaucrats in D.C. And uh, farm and food security is national security. We've heard that been said 10 times here already. And so we must do that, uh, everything that we can to tackle these challenges while supporting our farmers as uh, we continue to work to feed and fuel the world. Uh, so with that being said, maybe digging in a little bit here in regards to the regulations. And, uh, you know, I've always said that we need to make sure that regulations are based on science, not political science. And so in regards to that, in August to, uh, 2021, the Biden administration published a final rule that revoked all tolerances for chlorpyrifos uh, in farm country, Lord's Band, uh, effectively banning the use of this important crop protection tool for growers, including those sugar beet and soybean growers in Minnesota. Administer, Administrator Reagan publicly claimed that uh, the courts tied their hands. However, the Ninth Circuit gave the EPA the 
option to revoke or modify, modify those tolerances. Instead of following the science outlined by both EPA and USDA scientists uh, that allowed for 11 safe uses, the Biden administration chose to ban this. Uh, so Mr. Twining, can you talk about the dangerous precedent that this administration has set by choosing to use political science in making this uh, decision versus uh, you know, the science that both EPA and USDA has led us uh, with and then really just the uncertainty that this causes producers like myself? Yes, sir, and I always like to try to relate this back to uh, experiences all of us have every day in life. So when was the last time any committee member had a headache? What did they do? They went to the grocery store, probably, and bought a bottle of ibuprofen and took two pills and felt better in the morning. Now, was there risk associated with doing that? Absolutely. If you drank that whole bottle all at once, you'd probably be in the hospital having your stomach pumped and you might die. But we as a society say ibuprofen, the risk is worth the reward because it's closely studied, it's labeled by a federal agency, and we all understand and follow the directions. It's no different with pesticides. It's no different with a product like Lohr's Band. Safe, effective use of these products in accordance with label by pesticide applicators who are trained and licensed. And to use that product, you have to complete extensive training and obtain a license to use it. When we take those tools away from our producers, we deny not only our producers an option to better manage and more efficiently produce food, we raise the cost for every American. We cannot allow political science, opinions, and social media to influence science. And it is incumbent upon the members of this committee to stand firm for science and to push back against emotion and popular opinion and to educate people on the use of these tools. Yeah, thank you for that. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, change subject here a little bit in the couple seconds I have left here. Mr. Chairman, I want to I want to say thank you and I uh, really appreciate you bringing up the whole line speed issue. Um, and I would just comment that I'm sending a letter today to Secretary Vilsack urging the USDA to provide certainty specifically for the pork processing plants uh, by issuing an extension of the NSIS uh, time-limited trial. Uh, I've heard it loud and clear from producers in our state that it's very important. And Mr. Brown, thank you for uh, you know, bringing up this issue today also. Uh, I would just close with this comment. I appreciate your, uh, your work here. and. Uh, you testifying, um, I hear loud and clear every day that crop insurance is a number one tool that producers in Minnesota really count on for that security and that risk uh, management. I heard it brought up here again today, and I will tell you as a farmer, maybe on the hair younger side, and uh, especially watching my, uh, my seven children coming into the, the, the farm community, crop insurance is the number one tool for risk management on our farm. And so I appreciate your uh, willingness to, to be here today and to really comment to that. And, and I would uh, just uh, tell fellow members here that I stand ready to help work on ensuring that we have a safe and strong crop insurance component to the Farm Bill. Thank you. If, Mr. Chairman, if I could just <clears throat> thank Mr. Finstadt for sending that letter today. We greatly appreciate it. Our growers appreciate it. And it will help us be competitive in the international market. So thank you. Very good. Thank, uh, thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize the uh, gentlelady from Oregon, uh, Congresswoman Salinas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our panel. So I heard from many of you today that um, weather irregularity as the result of climate change is having a direct impact on our ag sector. And in Oregon's 6th District, which I represent, some of those impacts are from new problems and challenges like extreme heat and smoke damage from wildfires, and not just increased frequency or severity of the natural disasters we've previously had to endure. Unfortunately, despite the value and size of our agriculture sector, and I'm definitely hearing this from a lot of our growers, I just came back from my district work period and met with a lot of them, we're often left out of the conversation because a lot of these products we produce are less common. They're, you know, the specialty crops. And so Oregon is the nation's leader in the production of hazelnuts, grass seed, Christmas trees, and blueberries. 
And not only that, in Oregon, a dozen commodities each have a production value of more than $100 million. But as I mentioned, a lot of our growers really can't take advantage of some of these protection programs. So to Mr. LaRue and Mr. Duvall, my question is for both of you regarding margin protection insurance coverage. Would there be value in expanding it to more commodities in more regions of the country? Specifically, would it be possible to use this coverage for specialty crops like those in Oregon? Uh, in our organization, our policy supports uh, updating and broadening, uh, broadening the, the safety net for farmers to use. We th if you're out there farming, regardless of what you're farming, you, you, need to have, you deserve to have the same safety net as the others do. A absolutely. I would uh, just echo, uh, echo that. We strongly support that as well. And would just also add that I keep making reference back to the, uh, the work of the Food and Ag Climate uh, Alliance uh, and the fact that uh, especially to grow growers in particular who sometimes uh, don't always have easy way to access uh, conservation programs, et cetera, that, uh, that that be an issue that the committee consider as well. Thank you. And just to follow up on that a little bit, as we try some of these new programs, I feel like there should be some way to really assess and learn from the start of the programs and try to figure out what can be improved upon. So um, how, is, how have any of these programs that you've just mentioned um, been received by your members and what sort of enhancements could we make to the margin protection um, to make it more attractive to producers? I think what we talked to earlier is to make sure that we update the cost of production and targets in it to make sure it re represents today's modern day agriculture and the cost. Thank you. And I would just add that, you know, whether we're talking about the margin protection or whether we're talking about, you know, whole farm type of too often uh, access and entry into that kind of protection requires, if you're a very diversified producer, it can create additional burdens to even be able to have the paperwork and the coverage uh, isn't ultimately worth it. So ways to kind of streamline it uh, in addition to making sure that it's tied to cost of production I think is important. Thank you, and that's exactly what I'm hearing from my growers. So just shifting gears very quickly, um, I'd like to touch on the importance of SNAP, and I think we've heard um, from other members today. I think it's often overlooked that some of our most food insecure areas of the country, and certainly in Oregon, are rural. And analysis from the USDA shows that eligible Americans living in rural areas participate in SNAP at higher rates than those living in some of the urban areas. And I represent a particular rural area. Um, three, actually, of my five counties in my district are rural. And about 29% of the population are SNAP eligible. And so given that the economic impacts of SNAP are, tend to be stronger in rural communities um, and than urban areas and employment. Um, can you elaborate on how important SNAP is, to, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but how important SNAP is to rural communities and why the economic impact is so great? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, you know, we, we come to y'all and say, we don't really know what the needs are in the SNAP area. That's something that y'all have the resources to decide that, but we fully support it. Our farmers and ranchers give thousands and thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of dollars of product to food banks to help people all across this country. So we believe in helping people in a time of need. Uh, so uh, it is it's just important to make sure that that safety net there is for the, the people that are in that time of life where they need it and the safety net is there for us to assure that we be able to plant a crop next year. Not to make a living, but plant a crop. It's a safety net. And, the, and like said earlier, crop insurance is the cornerstone. It is, and if it can be updated, modernized, and broadened, it, it, it is a, could be the cornerstone of every farm out there. Thank you. We know that, uh, that our rural communities have a higher percentage of, of uh, senior citizens um, and families uh, who uh, too often may be in, in entrenched poverty uh, for either lack of access to jobs, et cetera. So food insecurity is definitely an issue that, you know, much like inflation, uh, it doesn't discriminate. Uh, uh, as someone from Appalachia, I mean, you know, we have long entrenched, you know, challenges there in addition to great people and uh, uh, great resources. And so making sure that that safety net is there available for, for all Americans in need uh, is important. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, General Lay. Now I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Congressman Rose, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott for holding this important hearing. 
As a lifelong farmer and former Tennessee Commissioner of Agriculture and a new member of the Ag Committee, I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to develop solutions to the challenges that American agriculture currently faces. I want to go ahead and dive right in. I want to talk a little bit more about the SEC's uh, Securities and Exchange Commission's proposed rule entitled Enhanced and Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosure for Investors that my colleagues have previously touched on today. In my view, if this proposed rulemaking is allowed to be finalized, it will have a devastating impact on farmers across the country. Under the proposed rulemaking, farms would be required to disclose considerable amounts of climate-related information in order to do business with public companies. In May of last year, I was proud to lead a bipartisan letter signed by well over 100 members of Congress to the Securities and Exchange Commission, pushing back on this foolhardy proposed rulemaking. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to have the letter, uh, the text of my letter, entered into the record. Without objection. President Duval, um, if this proposed uh, rulemaking is finalized, certainly, certainly you think that public companies, by and large, will be willing to pay farmers uh, more to account for the increased compliance costs calculating their emissions, or do you think that perhaps uh, increased costs of this rulemaking will simply be passed on to farmers? It will be passed on to farmers, and, and I can promise you that because we've seen regulations before end up in our laps that we had to pay for uh, because some regulation from the federal government was handed to somebody above us in the marketplace. Sure. As, as farmers know, we're price takers, not price setters, and, and I, think this, I think you're right about that. Economist Shelby Myers in a market intel report posted to the American Farm Bureau website last year stated that the, quote, SEC rule as proposed has the potential to require very detailed information from each farm that is not captured anywhere else down to how many gallons of fuel are put in each piece of machinery and each machine's emissions, unquote. President Duvall, as you are keenly aware, we face a huge challenge attracting and keeping future farmers as more and more young people choose not to or are unable to follow in their parents' footsteps and leave the profession. Do you feel that the burdensome and tedious prospect of potentially requiring farmers to calculate each and every gallon of fuel used on farms, as well as trying to decipher the emissions output of a wide range of farm equipment from tractors to weed eaters and even animals, might dampen the prospects of future generations joining the farming profession? It most certainly will. And it will also put uh, a, a force smaller to medium-sized farmers to uh, going out of business where larger farms have the, uh, might have the ability to do some of that or buy the machinery that will collect the data for them. I mean, it, that's the, the tentacles to this can be long and extensive into many areas of rural America. And in fact, amazingly, the rulemaking from the SEC contemplates exactly forcing uh, out providers or, or suppliers that can't meet the, the obligations imposed by the rule. Mr. Duval, uh, President Duval, I'd like to expand on, on this issue a little bit of, and ask you if you could talk about the efforts that American Farm Bureau is taking to spur interest in the profession of farming for the next generation. Yeah, we, we play an active role in all our youth organizations. I mentioned earlier that we are now participating in 4-H, FFA, uh, AFA, and Manners, and looking for others. Uh, and we want, uh, like I am a product of the Leadership Development Program, we want them to all know that when they come out of those organizations, they can come to our organizations. We'll help them fine-tune their God-given talent and let them be a leader in this great industry that we know and love. Thank you. Mr. Rosenbush, one of the major takeaways from your written testimony is that you highlighted that the U.S. only accounts for about 7 percent of global fertilizer production. This is obviously a troubling statistic. In, in, in the Fertilizer Institute's roadmap of solutions for Congress to consider in your written testimony, you mentioned that permit reform is essential for mining, construction, uh, of new production facilities and our infrastructure. Can you expand on how permitting reform can help in these areas, especially as it relates to the construction of new production facilities? 
Yeah, thank you, Congressman Rose. We are exposed as a country to the global supply and demand for fertilizer. And so anything we can do to help bolster domestic production would be positive, but permitting is one of the big challenges. So I referenced the example earlier of a phosphate mine uh, that, a, that a smaller business, small to medium cell business is trying to open. 10 years they've been working at this and $32 million uh, for that, that mining operation to begin. The phosphate's there. These resources are where God put them on earth. And so we can't go and, and deposit potash today, but we do have those phosphate reserves and we just need to equip industry with the ability to do it with accountabilities for review, timelines for review of these permitting, and ensure that we can go into production as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chairman, I yield back. Now, I thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize the son of a North Carolina farmer, uh, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you so much, um, Chairman Thompson, and to the ranking member for bringing us together today and to the witnesses who are here today. So I would like to start um, over the course of the last few weeks in particular. I've gone way beyond to just have conversations with farmers in my district. North Carolina uh, agriculture is still the leading industry and is extremely a uh, huge part of Eastern North Carolina's um, um, economy and community. Um, listening to the farmers in particular, heard about fertilizer, uh, regulations, pesticides in particular, fuel costs. Um, so, I mean, we hit on many of the things today. I would like to uh, zoom in just a little bit more in particular. Um, Mr. Rosenbush, uh, you highlight the importance of onshore um, fertilizer production and national security and agriculture economy. As we know, and you've talked about China has gained more and more uh, market share, potentially leaving the U.S. vulnerable um, in the event of the global um, conflict. Um, among the, the, roads, the roadmap, those legislative priorities, what I'm really trying to get a grasp of, and, and I want to be clear, we realize there are things beyond control, our control. Um, you hit on it, um, the wait and, see, wait and see, the global markets. But my question is, within those things that are within our control, what would you say is the greatest priority that could be most impactful? Um, because this is something that I've heard so many um, raise concerns about. Yeah, I'll, I'll name a couple that come to mind in addition to I've already mentioned. First of all, unfortunately, potash and phos phosphate are not on our critical minerals list. We've got to do everything we can to make sure those two are added back to the critical minerals list for the United States. Um, second, I would say that uh, our energy policy is going to have a huge impact on fertilizer production. When we think back to um, pre-shale revolution, uh, we had in the early two 2000s 27 nitrogen plants that shut down because of the high cost of natural gas. So uh, affecting policies that deliver sound energy solutions because that is the feedstock would be my second. Um, and then I would just say, you know, third is just anything that's, you know, as I think about an ag retailer, any of the, the PSM and the RMP rules and, the, and those just incremental regulations that add to the complexity of doing business would be uh, a third category of things that we could focus on. Uh, any idea in terms of moving in that direction, um, you talked about some decrease and moreover stabiliz stabilizing things. Do you think we could really continue to see uh, decrease or at least stabilization? Uh, are you talking about, talking about fertilizer prices? Yes, prices. Yeah, so I'm not allowed to talk about prices, gotcha. but I will just generally say, as, as Zippy mentioned, farmers have got to put nitrogen down going into the spring planting season. So I think some of the softening that we have seen over the winter uh, will begin to pick back up as demand increases and we get closer to, closer to that planting season. I think that approach to, well, let's see if we can get it at the lowest possible prices is, is kind of what's out there in the marketplace now. But when you just think about the fundamental supply and demand, uh, where we are with, uh, with crop prices, uh, I think you know, you'll, you'll actually see uh, things evolve as we go into spring and the rest of the year. And at the end of the day, farmers at these commodity prices have got to maximize yield, and the way to do that is with fertilizer. Okay. Uh, moving on, um, 
another question. Um, going across the district, and this topic continues to come up in terms of young people. I've traveled across the district, um, hearing from constituents the lack of opportunities to pursue careers uh, that's, that's vital to our local, state, and national economy here, including, we were talking about transportation, trunk, trucking, agriculture, manufacturing. Um, as you know, agriculture industry cannot function without reliable transportation. My question, Mr. Um, Friedman, would be, um, can you give any sense of what you think the committee can do, the work to engage either working with transportation, um, T&I, to increase opportunities for young people. Um, and I heard um, Mr. Duvall, and maybe I'll just leave this as a comment at this point as we're running out of time. How do we really make this nexus, this connection, when there's so many job opportunities with less, the lack of oper uh, students engaging? There's some disconnect here that's going on. I don't I, and I will leave it as a, a comment more so, uh, Mr. President, and yield back. All right. I mean, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman. Um, now I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Lamar, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my apologies for being in dual, dueling committees here today, so I've missed some of the, some of the testimony and, and such. So I hope I'm not redundant in my questions. Um, I wanted to throw this to Mr. Rosenbush on... Uh, Fertilizer, of course, being a globally traded product that uh, is of extreme importance to American ag, as we know, and in the yields that we've uh, made over the years. We've had, um, of course, the Ukraine situation, Russia, China, the whole works. Um, and on my own farm, we enjoyed at least triple the prices of fertilizer of uh, what we'd been used to previously. Um, What's uh, can you can you discuss a little bit on the current administration's uh, actions that are that are helping or harming the production and procurement of uh, of uh, the fertilizer we need? You know, because we know how heavily heavy um, an influence energy has on the production of fertilizer, as well as just getting it here. And and what more could we be doing to have? our domestic production of it be a much higher percentage instead of report relying on imports. Yeah, thank you, Congressman LaMalfa. And of course, you know, your, your district with rice producers didn't quite enjoy some of the same commodity prices. So it's especially, especially painful um, when, you, when you look at what's going on with inputs. Um, so I would say that, you know, just repeating some- so Half, some half my district didn't get to grow anything last year because of the Water supply, which is a whole other issue, but yeah. might get you covered. Go ahead. Yeah, water absolutely in California is a is a is a big issue. Um, I, you know, again, I think just looking at the restrictions around permitting uh, critical minerals of potash, potash and phosphate uh, on that critical mineral list, and anything related to energy that I've already mentioned, are, are of course top of mind. Um, I want to, to maybe spend a second talking a little bit about some of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's efforts here, and I would say, generally speaking, uh, their message is correct, and that is, how do we bolster more supply of fertilizer for the farmer? Um, and I think many of our small to medium-sized enterprises and companies that, you know, were able to take advantage of some of those grants appreciated those, and it does spur on innovation. At the end of the day, however, $500 million does not necessarily uh, open up a nitrogen plant that may cost two to four billion dollars mm. to build. Mm. Uh, what will really increase that capacity is looking at that permitting reform, looking at NEPA, looking at the uh, energy policies that will ensure we have a, a safe and abundant supply of natural gas as that feedstock. That's so where the do, numbers. Do you believe be that in this country, in this you know North American continent, that we have all the reserves of materials that we need to well, more than take care of our own needs in this country without imports? And could we competitively, had, if we you know, could streamline a little bit some of this permitting and, or flat out freeze and ban, would we be able to take care of ourselves with, with, we're, with very little import need? So fairly competitively on cost as well as availability, sorry. Yeah, no, great question. I mean, on the nitrogen phosphate side, yes. With the proper uh, policies in place, I think we can uh, definitely take advantage of providing those nutrients to the farmers. 
Potash, unfortunately, is a little bit of a different story. Those are all resource dependent of where it's been placed on this planet. And while we do have some potash reserves, we don't have nearly the supply that we would need. Remind overnight. me where most of the potash is, sir? Where do you, where Canada is where the largest supply of potash is. And then unfortunately, Belarus and Russia are two and three. Yeah. Over Nearly 50% of the global potash, potash supply is in Bel Belarus and Russia. And so okay. we know why those potash prices are being impacted when you think about the restrictions around that. Well, we ought to be able to get along with Canada, you would think. So, okay, uh, thank you. Mr. Duvall. Uh, but I, w I will say, though, that that, okay. that then requires good transportation policy, rail, cross-border transportation, et cetera. Yeah, the railroads, we've got to keep them working, and they've had their issues lately. So, Mr. Duvall, um, I, I just came from the transportation infrastructure uh, he hearing where we talked heavily about the waters of the United States regulation where we're working on a CRA to put it back in its place here instead of regulate every ditch, every every drop of water that falls from the sky seems some, somehow be belonging to the government and in their jurisdiction. Um, do, do you think, are, are, we, are we right to try and do the CRA right now or wait for the Supreme Court? Because where I see it, this WOTUS is extremely harmful right now. I, we, we only got a little time. Yeah, I, we are. We urged the EPA not to turn this new uh, rule in a loose until the second case was ruled on. Uh, but but they had made a commitment and had to come out with that rule. Uh, are we wise to do it now or, or wait until the ruling comes out? I'm not qualified to answer that question. All I know is we're hoping that there's going to be a ruling out of the Supreme Court that might help us and that we can change that uh, ruling to where it be give us some clear rules so our farmers. Uh, won't be burdened by the regulation. Yeah, well, the, the hypocrisy of it, and I'll, I'll yield here in a second, Mr. Chairman, is that we have a rule in place. EPA is trying to change it real quick and make it really worse for, for ag and for production with to, to little good effect and then wait for the Supreme Court. It seems to me if we just freeze everything and what it was without them putting a new rule in and then get the Supreme Court ruling on it, that might be pretty good. That's more or less what we're trying to do. So thank you for that. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Now please recognize the gentlelady from Illinois. Congresswoman Budzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you to the panelists for being here today. Um, my question is for Mr. LaRue. Um, I represent Central and Southern Illinois. We are lead um, producers of corn and soybean. Um, so my question is really about biofuels, and if you can kind of further elaborate on uh, what you've testified to and the impact on the development of biofuels that support rural communities, uh, like so many of the, dist of the communities that I have the opportunity to represent, I often say that biofuels is kind of a three-prong winner. One, it can reduce the price of gas for consumers. Uh, two, it can reduce our carbon footprint. But also third, and really importantly, it supports our family farmers in central and southern Illinois. And so I was really excited about the recent announcement by uh, United Airlines and the airline industry about how they're looking at utilizing biofuels and jet fuel. Um, and so I was just hoping, Ms. Le Mr. LaRue, if you could explain more about how the types, these types of investments and support for, for biofuels can support our rural communities, create jobs, um, and other positives, I think, that it can get at for our agricultural communities. No, uh, you're absolutely right. I think you said it best, actually, that uh, biofuels in general uh, are a win-win-win. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's great for our rural communities. Uh, again, talking a lot about those diversified markets and making sure that farmers have, have options. Uh, it uh, returns that economic uh, value back to the community. Uh, it also does reduce uh, cost to consumers at the pump. Uh, which is uh, obviously of great concern right now with inflation. And then on top of that, it is also a win for the climate um, and climate mitigation. Um, if you want to look for ways to pull carbon out of the uh, uh, process right now, and particularly in the fuel space, replacing um, uh, petroleum products with uh, ethanol and biofuels in general uh, is the most immediate way to do that. And so I think that this combination, if you will, this triple win uh, for consumers and the public, for those communities and those farmers, um, and for uh, sustainability and climate, I think is, is puts biofuels in a great spot. And, the, and this diversification is going to continue. You made reference to sustainable aviation fuel. Um, we certainly want to make sure that as we do look at that, that 
uh, our farmers are able to produce the feedstocks to, to go into that and that we don't have restrictions that limit uh, that availability. So certainly we're hopeful and we want to keep making that move. Um, but uh, there continues to be a bright spot on the horizon for biofuels uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you. And since I have a little bit more time, maybe if I could ask an additional question. Um, in, my, in my district, I get the opportunity to represent the University of Illinois, um, Archer Daniels Midlands in Decatur. Uh, we often talk about how the Decatur to Champaign corridor is kind of the ag tech corridor. Um, and so one of my questions is really around agricultural resource, research, excuse me, and this is for really anyone on the panel. But you know, how can more investments in agricultural research in the programs that the university University of Illinois is looking at and precision farming, also further development and in, in, in looking into carbon capture sequestration as an important technology. How can ag research and investment in that actually help then save money for our family farmers through that technological um, um, investment? Yeah, those, those research dollars that are spent in our land grant colleges are so important to agriculture. It not only keeps us on the cutting edge and makes our farmers sustainable, it also discovers some, some of the uh, basic uh, discoveries that industry picks up and, and refines and brings onto the farm to, eat, to, to help us to do an even better job. So research and development dollars are crucially important, but, you get, but I don't want to stop there. I want to talk about what extension does. Uh, you know, for, for, since my grandfather, the extension agent has been and still is, the person that a small, medium-sized farm depends on to get that knowledge from the, uh, re the land-grant college to the farm itself and that farm family. I, I would just add, you know, quite frankly, that you know, while the uh, land-grant universities are an important uh, spot for a lot of that research and making sure that 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 we're uh, keeping that research uh, well-funded so that the innovation can be driven, um, I, I think that you know, as we look ahead to the next farm bill. Uh, looking for also ways that uh, Congress can best uh, spur that uh, innovation as well, even with big projects, uh, whether it's the DARPA kind of ag version of that. Um, I, I think that there are opportunities in the, in the Farm Bill to make sure that we are looking big picture as well as uh, the more applied research. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize. Uh, Gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Friedman, you mentioned in your testimony the rulemaking proceeding before the FMC, which is flowing from OSERA, which passed last year. You alluded to the fact that rule promulgation proceedings are kind of always an opportunity for the stakeholders to relitigate areas that maybe weren't fully fleshed out by the legislation. Give us a sense on whether or not you think the rulemaking proceeding is going well, whether or not it's adhering to congressional intent. Depends on which uh, rulemaking. Uh, the rulemaking on what is the centerpiece is, you know, the detention, demurrage, these extra charges that the ocean carriers are imposing on U.S. exporters. Um, actually uh, started off with a bang and was terrific. I mean, instead of waiting till they did the rulemaking to implement, they made it effective on the date you got that thing passed and signed by the president, which is unprecedented. So they made it effective right away. Uh, they are moving forward, and in fact, they've added to the very good criteria that you added to make sure the ocean carrier has the decency to tell the exporter what they're charging for, you know, those information elements. There were 12. There are now 21. That, in other words, they went further, which is great. Uh, there are some problems because maybe backsliding, they may decide that you can impose detention to merge charges on truckers rather than the exporters. So that needs to be watched. But that's, that's one that's very good. Uh, on another critical element of your legislation, uh, where the carriers were refusing to carry U.S. exports, U.S. agriculture exports particularly, and they would prefer to go back to Asia, which is our biggest market, empty, with a lot of empty containers, so they can pick up more of the stuff that we're wearing, all the import stuff, uh, and bring it back faster. That left a lot of our agriculture stranded and not just stranded at the port, stranded all the way back in the middle of the country, all throughout the center of the country. Um, 
they went through a rulemaking pretty quickly on that, uh, and we were pretty unhappy, actually, how quickly they moved through that without any intention. It didn't appear to actually implement any uh, limitations on the carrier's ability to refuse to carry exports. And now they're coming back and doing it again. Um, to the extent you had a role in, in encouraging them to do that, we appreciate that. But we do need to have that continued oversight. And I do think it, it illustrates the fact that there may yet be room, uh, legislative space here for another bipartisan victory as we look at maybe a Ocean Shipping Reform Act 2.0 to put some finer points on uh, areas where maybe the FMC didn't quite hit the target. Cor correct. And, and you know, right now, in, right now, when we're not in this uh, pandemic environment where there's not this huge volume of cargo coming in and overwhelming the ocean carriers, the ports, the railroads, the trucks, there's plenty of competition by the ocean carriers to c carry U.S. agriculture exports and forest products right now. But, you know, things will change. And things will happen again where we're going to have to assure there's competition. And we need to make sure that there's a mechanism by the government to review ocean carrier plans to this consolidation so that we don't wake up in a couple of years when the economy turns again and there's more demand and there are even fewer ocean carriers around. Right now, as I said, not a problem. Plenty of competition. All, all your folks in uh, South Dakota and all through the country are loving the ocean carriers traveling from all over the world asking for their cargo. But that's the opposite of what you were addressing a, a year ago. Right? Yeah, well, a free market's many buyers and many sellers. Mr. Right. LaRue earlier was talking about kind of the robustness of the market and how that can have an impact yes. on price, certainly, and, and there's no question about that. Moving to Mr. LaRue, I had seen that the Biden administration uh, pivoted a little bit on FIFRA. Uh, they said new administration, uh, kind of a new approach on federal preemption of pesticide labeling. I've got some concerns about that. Uh, where am I wrong? Yeah, I know. I, I don't know that you are wrong. <laughs> uh, we certainly share those uh, those concerns, and we're watching it very carefully. Uh, really, seeing the uh, U.S. Solicitor General uh, weighing in uh, on uh, questions of labeling too is is I, I think giving a lot of questions about this administration and how they are approaching uh, pesticide pesticide access and uh, and how we might uh, see a patchwork of uh, regula uh, regulations across the country. And I think in terms of, from the farmer's point of view, uh, this is of great concern and should be something that the committee is looking at. I'm out of time, which is tragic because I've got good stuff for Mr. Duval and Mr. Brown, but I yield back, sir. I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, now, please recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Sorensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Sorensen, and I represent the farm families and the communities in Illinois' 17th Congressional District. I was born in this district, uh, where farming is much more than growing crops and raising livestock. Um, it puts food on the table, uh, fuel in our cars, and clothes on our backs. As my fellow Illinois colleague, Ms. Bazinski mentioned, our state, Illinois, is the leading soybean producer and the second largest corn producer in our country. That's why it's imperative that the upcoming farm bill preserves crop insurance programs and fortifies the supply chains that we saw break. It also must include robust investment in agricultural research that focuses on improving farm and community resilience uh, so that we can address the challenges of resource quality and enrich productivity by growing more on less land with fewer inputs. Um, securing these provisions in the upcoming Farm Bill and ensuring that the $43.8 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act reaches our farmers and ranchers, this allows us to be responsible stewards of our land. Uh, our land, our water, our livestock, while we foster a thriving agricultural e economy. Uh, located in my district, uh, the Jacobs Brothers Farms um, have been in operation for three generations. Uh, they raise beef cattle, corn, wheat, soybeans, and rye. Uh, sourcing parts for their farm equipment has been a challenge, and also the rising costs of pesticides and fertilizer are a great concern to them. Uh, Mr. Rosenbush and Mr. LaRue, what can Congress do today to strengthen our supply chains, to keep costs manageable, 
and equipment parts accessible for farmers like the Jacobs. Uh, again, it's a great question, and we could probably spend a uh, you know big better part of the day uh, talking about that. But just to summarize very quickly, I would just uh, again stress for uh, the challenges that you uh, presented. It's as, as much about making sure that there is fair um, uh, competition and access out there, uh, the markets. When you have a fully functioning and competitive market. That makes sure that these laws of supply and demand that we talk about a lot here are actually working um, and that we have true competition. Um, and in the absence of that, uh, we run into all sorts of challenges. That's on top of any kind of supply chain disruptions that we have. So as far as actions that Congress could take right now, it's ensuring um, that we are doing everything possible to create that uh, fair playing field um, out there. And then uh, I would say on top of that, uh, you know, many of the things that uh, Mr. Rosenbush uh, talked about in terms of creating access for even more domestic access. So for the sake of not repeating some of the things I've said, I would just point out that um, there is a piece of legislation on the Senate side that Senator Marshall has introduced to address this exact topic called the Sustained Act. So if there's one thing Congress could do is uh, I'd love for someone here in the House to pick up the companion bill here and push that forward. That would make a huge impact. Uh, my background is being the local meteorologist. Um, I talked about climate change on television uh, such that I didn't realize that our farm families were the ones that were watching me. Uh, they couldn't believe anybody out there, but they could believe Eric Sorensen for this. And they've come to me and they've said, Eric, we trust that you're going to listen because so many people in Washington don't listen to us because we know things are changing and we, we want to stop the politicization of, of climate. How can we all come together? I would take this opportunity to, to again make reference to the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. This is an alliance that really is unique in many ways. Uh, we've talked about the fact that Farmers Union is joined by uh, Farm Bureau at that table, but also with uh, the environmental community, with uh, the food manufacturers uh, community, um, and forestry, as well as uh, many in the conservation uh, community have all come together. Many of the recommendations that we've made forward for the, the upcoming Farm Bill were all consensus. Uh, they were all focused on making sure that they were science-based, um, incentive-based, um, and really where possible create new market opportunities here. So if we are approaching climate uh, with that kind of consensus and keeping a focus on uh, the science, uh, I, I think we would go a long way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman. Now we're uh, pleased to recognize the uh, gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, team. I appreciate you being out here in Washington for this. I know we all like to be looking at getting back in the, into the field as soon as it thaws here. Um, President Duvall, I'm going to be coming to you first, my friend. As a member of Iowa's third congressional district and the, you know, part of a family of century farmers in our home state, I've heard from countless farmers on the impact of inflation has been highlighted here today. Iowa's producers and their ability to both feed and fuel the supply chain disruptions, the labor shortages, Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine and the impact on fertilizer have all contributed to a significant hike in the price of crucial farm inputs like fuel. In just two years, the average price of a gallon of diesel fuel has increased by 95%, making it hard for everybody to not only get to that field, but also to be able to harvest and feed our families. And I've got six kids, so that's a big impact. <laughs> Additionally, in 2022, the average price of gasoline reached its highest level on record ever. As input costs continue to rise, farmers' abilities to ensure the continuation of abundant food supply decreases. I was the number one producer of biofuel, providing a homegrown solution that positively impacts our environment, our economy, and American producers. However, the nation enters the summer of 2023 still having a ban on year-round ethanol blends that constrict our biofuel um, producers. So, Zippy, one of the things I want to ask you about is how would a year-round E15 relieve the current pressure uh, on inflation and place our farmers and consumers in a better position? Well, it'd lower the cost. Yes, the sir. Consumers, and it would bolster the rural communities where they're growing, growing that the, the soybeans and corn, and and, that, and it's that's a simple fact. Uh, there is a 
I call it. I'm wearing my cotton tie today. There's a <laughs> there's an infrastructure around ethanol, and there's a big infrastructure around cotton, and it affects those rural communities uh, extremely. And when you try when you hold that back, it limits their ability to thrive and 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 be better. We're going to get you a corn tie to go with that cotton tie. Thanks, yes. Mr. President. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Brown, we'd like to chat with you a little bit as well here. Um, my home state gets the privilege of leading in egg production, but with the spike in egg prices, highly pathogenic avian influenza has received a great deal of attention in news reports across the country recently. I'd like to talk about how that disease has affected specifically the chicken industry. Is there anything the industry, Congress, or USDA needs to be considering to best address that problem today? Thank you for your question. Uh, between uh, the egg layer industry, the turkey industry, and the chicken industry, we've been the least affected. A lot of that has to do with our biosecurity procedures, uh, our housing, and, and our market, the way we move our birds to market more quickly. Uh, but what we can do is continue to support APHIS, who I'll give high marks to for what they've been out there uh, in doing and working with industry. Another thing that I would like to raise while we're here is that the uh, chicken meat industry uh, move about 380 million eggs a year into rendering uh, because up until 2009, those eggs were allowed to be used in commerce uh, for, uh, for egg hatching uh, and pasteurization, so they're totally safe. But FDA came up with a rule, 2009, knocked us out. Well, 380 million birds a year, if they could go to pasteurization, can help you respond to your constituents when they're talking about the price of eggs being too high. That's a very high volume. And if we go back to 2009, when that rule was implemented to today, uh, that's 5 billion birds. I think my staff tells me uh, 5.3 billion eggs. Hmm. So that's one thing this committee could consider. Mr. Brown, thank you very much. Uh, I will just end by saying to all the farmers, the ranchers, the growers that you represent collectively on both sides of the aisle, thank you much for your service and your advocacy for them out here. I hope that this committee can do right by them. I wish you all a good growing season coming up. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back my time. All right, thank the gentleman. Now please recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Vasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Gabe Vasquez, and I represent the second district of New Mexico. Uh, we are uh, storied dryland farmers that grow the prized hatch chili that many of us put on our enchiladas across the country to go with some of that delicious chicken and livestock and beef, as well as onion, cotton, corn, alfalfa, pecans, and more. Uh, today's hearing focuses on issues incredibly important to the farmers and ranchers in my district, and that is the rising cost of everything. New Mexico is a vital part of the American agricultural landscape but our farmers and our rural areas are hit harder by inflation and uncertainty than in other parts of the country. I just recently met with dairy farmers in Doniana and in Luna counties, and one of the most common problems I heard was their inability to access federal programs, uh, qualify for federal programs, and how expensive it was to keep their operations viable. The farms and ranches in my district are more than just farms and ranches. They are part of the fabric of our culture and our identity, and that includes our dairies. And so when they suffer, our entire district and community suffer. Now, specific to dairies, uh, my question is here for uh, Mr. LaRue. Uh, Mr. LaRue, in your opinion, uh, when it comes to the federal milk marketing orders, uh, do those need to be reformed or reworked? And if so, what are some suggestions to rework them to make that program more viable for our existing dairy farmers? Well, appreciate the question, and I would just uh, first, uh, I'm smiling a little bit, only because uh, I never anticipated being on this side of this table, uh, uh, taking a question on federal milk marketing orders. Uh, when I was, tip uh, in the past life, have uh, been on the back side there. But the, uh, I, the the question is, is that we do have a lot of work to do on, on federal milk marketing orders, and, and you talk about uh, the dairyman uh, and dairy producers uh, in New Mexico, uh, the challenges exist uh, all across the country. I think, you know, much of the work that's also uh, being done by other farm organizations uh, on this space, uh, I think will help lead the way. The bottom line though for dairy producers, right, is making sure that they can uh, cover their cost and actually uh, be able to return a little bit of, of money there. So whether it's uh, questions around improving uh, federal order uh, hearings and uh, the way that voting currently uh, actually limits uh, individual uh, farmers' uh, input into that. 
um, as well as uh, order reform itself. I think that's something that uh, we're very, very much looking forward to engaging this committee on. Thank you, Mr. LaRue. Uh, in a recent study conducted by New Mexico State University uh, showed about 15% uh, loss of dairy farms over the last two years in New Mexico. A large part of that, from what I've heard from producers, is the increased uh, feed and fertilizer costs as well as supply chain disruptions. Under the Dairy Margin Coverage Program, uh, very small farms are eligible for assistance, but many farms are just large enough to not qualify uh, for coverage, contributing to the decline in dairy farms in New Mexico and in my district. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Duvall. Uh, Mr. Duvall, does the Farm Bureau have an opinion uh, of how the DMC program could be changed to include dairy, farm, uh, dairy farms in this coverage gap? Uh, well, first off, we, we uh, go back to my original statement. We want it to be modernized and upgraded, and in doing that, we think that would take care of that problem. And also, uh, we, a couple of years ago, uh, went to uh, Federal Crop and asked if we could create a product for dairy farmers that's out there right now that can be purchased for farmers to help them. And uh, it took several years to get it done, but there is something over and above that. Thank you so much. Now, when the government calculates inflation, it only takes into account the prices that urban Americans uh, pay into account. This means that 46 million Americans living in districts like mine are invisible when we talk about the challenges of rising costs and inflation. Uh, to any one of our panelists, uh, how can we address the disparity of rural versus urban inflation and provide relief and make good policy that helps support rural Americans that live outside of major cities? I think it's a great question. I'm not sure I have. I, I'd love to follow up as, as well. But the, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate you raising this question about the way that they measure uh, inflation and that uh, it's typically uh, certainly underrepresents uh, at best uh, the impact on on our rural commu uh, communities. In a recent conversation with the Federal Reserve uh, out of uh, Kansas City. They were highlighting this question and are looking internally about ways to do that. But whatever we can do to make sure that the true picture and the true impact and cost uh, in rural communities uh, is uh, able to be seen more clearly, I think would certainly be something we support. Thank you so much, Mr. Ralu. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your advocacy and your support for our farmers and ranchers. New Mexico 2nd District, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honored to be here today representing Missouri's farmers and ranchers, 95,000 farms in the great state of the Missouri, uh, number two in the nation. We recently introduced our first piece of legislation, the Amplifying Processing of Livestock in the U.S., called the A-plus Act. Our bill works to fix regulatory roadblocks to increasing meat processing capacity and really allow livestock auction market owners to invest in small and regional packing facilities. President Duvall, I'd like to start with you today. In your testimony, you talked about several regulations that burden our farmers and ranchers instead of really helping them. Um, in your estimation, how would the A-plus Act modernize some of these outdated rules and regulations? Well, one, we, uh, I'm a cow-calf producer. And they're the last ones to get talked about. But I promise you that feeder and that packer can't do it without us because we, we're producing the calves for them. Uh, uh, we need transparency to be able to see what the market is doing so that we can better market our animals out there. Um, but to get to your question, uh, th those, uh, that act uh, allowing uh, those uh, livestock markets to be able to participate in it, we encourage that growth of that middle to small size processor. And we think it would uh, tremendously help our local cow-calf guys and our local uh, small family feeders to be able to utilize that. And I guess the regulation around that would be whether or not there's enough federal inspectors to go around to doing that. And are we really using technology to its fullest in that, in that location? So uh, I think there's a big question around that. Thank you very good, sir. Mr. Twining, in your written testimony, you mentioned that county-level bans on crop protection tools are ineffective, inefficient, and overly broad measures. Um, it's something our farmers in our district are facing each and every day. Just this past uh, year, uh, there was a county-level ban on the use of Enlist One, Enlist Duo in 200 counties uh, in America, including five in our district, uh, due to the presence of the American burying beetle. The EPA did decide to lift the ban in 134 of those counties in March of 2020, 
to the problem was uh, there was a lot of confusion and uncertainty in that among the producers right before the start of the growing season. So can you talk more about why county level bans are a bad idea to begin with? This is something that unfortunately we face frequently and it's very disruptive to business. Um, you can't operate in an environment where you go from one county to the next and the rules are different. Um, and there's not transparency on some of these and why it's important that the uh, EPA's uh, Endangered Species Act process include the end users and be flexible for local conditions and specific cropping systems. Uh, the best analogy I could give you, if you were trying to teach a high school class of drivers how to drive, and every county had a different set of rules and regulations of the road, you'd never be successful. We can't run a business in an environment like that, neither can growers or producers. Very good point. My uh, last question goes to Mr. Friedman. Um, you had talked about earlier, I'm sorry we're in and out as, as Congress people because we're in three different committees at one time. We're trying to spin some plates here, but these are all very important issues. You had mentioned earlier in your testimony there are 10 uh, ocean carriers in existence, right? None of those are U.S. owned. Is that what you said? How many are owned or controlled by the communist Chinese government? So 20 percent. We're also uh, blessed to be on the House Armed Services Committee, and really this information that's come out, really it's been around for several years now, that China is the number one threat to our national security. If we were to have a conflict with China in the next decade or so, uh, it's largely going to be a sea war. What impact would that have on the distributions of goods uh, coming in and out of America on these transport ships? Sorry. I think we have adequate uh, carriage. The, the rest of the world does because all these other ocean carriers are owned, uh, European countries uh, and Taiwan as well, uh, and Japan, uh, Singapore. So, you know, I think there's adequate coverage uh, because, in fact, I don't think between Costco and OCL that they have uh, tw quite 20 percent, because one of those, Costco is big, OCL is much smaller. So I think there's adequate coverage uh, if we needed to uh, with the other carriers. And there's some additional capacity, as we learned during the pandemic, that will come in to service uh, if there's a demand for it. Thank you. Thank you to all our witnesses. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, please to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Jackson, for Five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson. Honored to be on the committee and ranking member Scott. This too is my first agriculture committee meeting, serving Illinois' first congressional district in a district that is seeing uh, an expansion of a food desert that we have borne the brunt of the uh, consolidation efforts in the food industry. Mr. LaRue, could you please speak to that and how we can turn this trend around? Yeah, well, food deserts, wherever they uh, occur, are you know, remain an enormous challenge. We know that in rural America, in lots of places where farmer uh, communities have uh, so far to to drive to to get access to any sort of uh, uh, food grocery store of any size. Uh, the the larger question here, uh, from our perspective, is again, it's a theme <laughs> that we're striking, but this question of uh, could a focus on consolidation and efficiency at the expense of making sure that there is a diversified access, uh, in this case, access to food in these food deserts uh, remains uh, an important challenge. Uh, National Farmers Union is a proud member of the Alliance uh, to End Hunger, where we work uh, closely with a number of private companies, uh, uh, public companies, faith-based organizations and so forth, again, on these big challenges as we look ahead to the next Farm Bill. Uh, we're certainly willing to work with you and others uh, to find ways to, to uh, alleviate the challenge and the problem. Thank you. A question to the general panel. Are any of you concerned in your industry uh, with foreign investment in our agricultural industry? We have 50% of our beef uh, in the country being processed by Brazilians. We have a large percentage of uh, much of the rest of our protein being sourced by either uh, uh, Chinese-owned companies, et cetera. The 
question around consolidation in agriculture is not just one about monopolies or near monopolies and the impact that that has on the free market uh, and competition, but it is also, we keep throwing around this national security and food security, which absolutely this is about. And so to have so much of that processing and that much control uh, in the hands uh, of others, I think raises big questions. Last question, do our foreign investors have a cost and a competitive advantage structurally against our small local farmers in the United States? And if so, what can we do to level the playing field? Well, for example, I've seen in catfish prices and other things that are shipped in from China and other places that how are they able to uh, ship food back into the United States? That's a scavenger fish we have. We're importing food um, from so many other countries. Is there a structural competitive advantage that they share over our American farmers? So I would say that, yes, there is in certain areas of the world where we have to uh, abide by certain regulations that's put out by the federal government. Those countries may or may not have, and whether or not we have the capability to really inspect and make sure they're abiding by the same rules that we are. And I would doubt that very seriously. I don't have any proven uh, statistics to prove that, but uh, there are a lot of regulations we have to deal with, especially when it comes to uh, fruits and vegetables and what they have to do to, to send it on to the market. And there's a lot of competitive fruits and vegetables coming in here and being dumped on our market and, and uh, causing real harm to our farmers. Sir, and I would add that a lot of the competitive disadvantages that we face against foreign competitors are caused by our own government. I mentioned to you earlier or to the committee about the line speed issue. We've got our hands tied behind our back. Uh, while other nations can operate at 30% more. And Mr. Chairman, I'm not looking to pick a scab or start another war uh, at this table or in this committee room. But talk about regulations, and everybody loves the biofuels, and it all sounds great and dandy. But when that was put forward in 2007, in Bush 43's administration, and put into effect in 2008, one of the largest drivers of concentration in the chicken industry was the ethanol rule. Thirteen companies in two years, gone. That's all I have to say about it. Thank you. I yield my time back. Thank you, Chairman Thompson. I thank the gentleman. Now please to recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Van Orden, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all of you for coming today. You guys are absolute rock stars. I appreciate it greatly. Um, I want you to indulge me for a second so that I can frame this problem set from a slightly different perspective. Um, I firmly believe that food security is national security and that the Biden administration is jeopardizing our national security with their war on energy that's making it more difficult for our farmers to feed the world, our nation, and that includes our military. Napoleon Bonaparte famously said that an army marches on its stomach and that is a true statement. Mr. Rosenbush, I'd like to address this to you and like your thoughts. The fertilizer market appears to have stabilized, but with the current current international environment and taking in mind your quote, fertilizer is a globally traded commodity subject to international pressures and the geopolitical events. I do not have confidence that this market will stay stable. Uh, in your written testimony, you presented several different charts demonstrating that China and Russia, and in your verbal statement, you said Belarus with the production of potash hold a strategic advantage over the United States of America. and with their uh, fertilizer production and distribution around the world. You point out that 90% of the fertilizer used outside the, is outside, used outside of the United States of America. And my concern is that through foreign aid, the United States is providing food products, beans, rice, and corn, where, to the world, where China and Russia are following the adage of give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach them how to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. So my question to you is this. Do you believe if we were to onshore our fertilizer industry and production capacity, understanding that the majority of potash will have to come from Canada, who are our friends, do you believe that we could potentially remove a strategic advantage of China and Russia on the world stage and increase our strategic advantage globally? And if so, how would you propose doing so? 
Yeah, great, great question. The, um, you know, I'll just point out it's been interesting to watch the China decisions around their export restrictions and a lot of speculation as to why they did that. Obviously, the, the, the line is to ensure that their farmers have the fertilizers that they need. Right. So if you apply that to our thinking, I will say that we are a net importer of fertilizer, and we do need that supply in order to give farmers uh, the, the nutrients that they need, while also facilitating expansion of our own self-reliance in fertilizer. We talk about the capital-intensive nature of these investments, and the markets are cyclical. I mean, we went through a period of years before where we currently are where a lot of fertilizer companies, and I'm sure Mike can comment to this too, were losing a lot of money and were not profitable. So that, I think that cyclical nature of the industry is common, and of course we're at a different swing for it right now. But the key is we've got to have that regulatory certainty so that we can make those investments in these capital-intensive uh, facilities so that we can increase our own direct capa domestic capacity. Yes, sir, I understand that we need regulatory certainty, but would you potentially propose a large capital investment in the domestic fertilizer industry? By the government? Yes. Well, I, th I think our, our, um, our companies are adequately equipped to make those investments. I don't know that we need to nationalize uh, fertilizer manufacturing and keep that as a free, free market, free enterprise system. Uh, I think you can just look at India and see the challenges when you nationalize a fertilizer system. So they procure all of their nutrients as a central government, then subsidize it and provide to the farmer. They particularly had a really difficult time because China locked them out of the market, and yeah. then they had to go source all of that on a global on a global basis. In That's addition correct. to what they do, so, so I so you're you have confidence that the private industry would be able to produce enough capital in order to onshore our fertilizer industry in case of a national emergency, or in order to give us a strategic advantage over China and Russia globally. Is that correct? I believe that they can make those investments if the permitting and the things that they need to reach those investments can be facilitated with the caveat that they are resource dependent. We don't have potash reserves here and right. we'll continue to rely on our friends from the north. Well, as a conservative Republican, I appreciate your point of view. I yield back. I thank gentlemen for yielding back. Um, I think, as most folks are aware, uh, votes are to be called, there'll be two votes called at 1.30. Uh, the first one will be 15 minutes or so. So even calculating that it's not always just 15 minutes. Um, I apologize. We're gonna, I want to get everybody an opportunity to ask questions, but we're going to reduce the time to four minutes. Um, so, and I apologize for that, but uh, that is a result of an outstanding and great participation today, So, which is much appreciated. And so please uh, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Kassar, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, and I want to keep working on the, off the question that my friend, uh, Congressman Jackson, uh, brought up. I represent Texas Congressional District 35, which stretches from East Austin down to the west side of San Antonio. And my district includes several food deserts uh, that have made it difficult for people in my community to access high quality food. We also have a lot of folks that are working class and low income in some of the most expensive areas of my state. Uh, one example is the Del Valley community, an area of thousands of people that does not have a single major grocery store in it. So Mr. LaRue, in your written testimony, you warn about the increasing impact of, cons of consolidation, uh, declining competition, and how that is having an impact on food deserts, food prices, and food access impacting communities like those that I represent. Can you talk us through what Congress can do and what this committee can do to reduce consolidation, promote food access, uh, lower costs, and support communities uh, like Del Valley where um, it's real expensive to live there, uh, food costs going up has a real impact, and they don't even have a major grocery store. Yeah, thank you for raising uh, the issue again here. Um, I, I think that this, this committee plays an important role in making sure that, that there is open and fair competition, uh, even within this uh, committee's jurisdiction. Uh, whether that's uh, uh, everything from making sure that there are uh, fair rules and fair treatment uh, within um, uh, the, the livestock sector, for example, through the Packers and Stockyards Act, making sure that, uh, that we are investing in uh, additional processing um, and uh, food 
uh, distribution uh, chains out there. We, uh, all of these chains, whether we're talking about the groceries or the suppliers to the groceries, uh, down to the processors, uh, producers ultimately, um, finding ways to uh, increase the investment in building out that infrastructure is going to be critical. Ultimately, the big questions are going to be uh, uh, beyond this committee's scope. Uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, the antitrust laws that, again, have been on the books for well over 100 years, uh, but uh, need some uh, enforcement uh, review that we haven't seen for several decades. So it's a big question, but I think that there are clear things that this committee can be doing uh, to be effective. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, and now please recognize the, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Miller, for four minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, the ranking member, and thank you for all the panel today and your honesty. Farming provides one out of seven jobs in Ohio and is the number one contributor to our state's economy. However, Ohio and U.S. farmers continue to face economic uncertainty due to unprecedented inflationary input costs, diminishing trade opportunities, and an ever-increasing regulatory framework at a time when our nation's agricultural producers are called to meet global food insecurities. Mr. Duvall. You, re you also raised challenges for the American agriculture in your testimony detailing, beginning with losses, experience from the trade war with China, pandemic lockdown, supply chain disruptions, and record input costs, farmers and ranchers have been facing unprecedented volati volatility in recent years. I note that USDA has recently projected total U.S. exports to decrease 8% over the next 10 years, causing more uncertainty. Also, United States dairy farmers are being impacted by unfair trade practices as Canada, which is our friend of the North, but sometimes not so much, uh, is not living up to its own obligations under the USMCA. Despite a negative ruling in the dispute resolution process concerning dairy market access, exports are critical to the economic viability of U.S. dairy farmers today with one-sixth of all U.S. milk is sold commercially around the world in dairy products. When exports increase, the entire supply chain benefits. Ohio State University has correlated that inflation and high food costs can have an impact on the United States agricultural trade. As when commodity input costs rise and food prices increase, trading partners pull back purchasing, therefore reducing U.S. trading opportunities for United States farmers. So in conclusion, can you share what the loss of trading opportunities may mean for the American agricultural sector and every American and individual across this world? It, it would be tremendous. and. and can't speak exactly to dairy, but every third row of corn and every third row of soybeans uh, either go to production of uh, fuel that's going to be exported somewhere else. Uh, uh, being, a, being able to trade with other company, uh, other countries uh, opens up the market for us to be able to, to be more productive, more uh, 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 resilient, and more sustainable on our farms. And, and we have depended on trade for many, many years. And when it's dis disrupted, like we've seen here lately, especially before the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, it, it costs uh, farmers and everyone tremendous amounts of money because exactly what my friend here to my right said, when, when, it, when we can't ship it overseas, it'll go back into our local market and depress the prices to farmers. Thank you very much, and I don't mean to pick on you, but Mr. Duvall, in your testimony, which I enjoyed a lot, you state inflation is slashing the purchasing power of American consumers and weakening the economy, which both undercuts demand for farm products and lowers prices. Inflation is driving up the price of groceries in Ohio. We see it every day in the 7th District, increasingly pinching Ohioans' budgets. Farmers and consumers alike are suffering from spiking food prices, as USDA reports. Food at home prices increased by 11.4% in 2022. It's incredible. With costs continuing to rise 7.1 percent thus far in 2023, Mr. Duvall, can you elaborate on how inflation can increase the cost of inputs, which can reduce farmers' economic viability and in the end make it more difficult to provide affordable food for our families and to make it affordable for all of you to help us? Good, good observation. And if you just take a family and what you have to purchase to get that family through the day, and, and compare it to what a farmer has to spend to produce that food that they're going to pr produce. I mean, it, it is tremendous uh, of what percentage increase that we've seen from fertilizer to fuel 
in everything that we do, and then you compound it with overregulation, it even makes it more difficult for farmers to survive. And in that increase that food people are consuming or paying for food at the grocery store, very little, if none of that, is getting back to the farmer. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now please to recognize for four minutes the gentlelady from Hawaii, uh, Ms. Tokuda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we've got a lot to talk about ag. I would welcome all of you to come to my home state of Hawaii anytime, and we can show you what ag's all about. I accept. I think you'll get some volunteers. There we go. <laughs> Um, thank you very much to the witnesses for being here. You know, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, about 40% of farmland in the United States is rented, most of it owned by landowners, as you know, who are not actively involved in farming. Uh, in September 2022, a survey of the National Young Farmers Coalition, young farmers named finding affordable land for purchase as one of the top barriers and challenges last year. Now, to all of you, you know, the cost of land and rent, especially in my home state of Hawaii, is a barrier for both new as well as long-time family farmers, new farmers, and a major expense for small family farms who lease their land. Do any of your organizations or any of you here at the panel have any concerns about private equity and non-agricultural corporate investors purchasing agriculture land? As we know, Bill Gates owns a majority, a vast majority of the farmland here in the United States. What do you feel has to be done? What's a solution for farmers that are looking at the cost of land as a barrier? Okay, I'll go ahead and answer, because it's a huge question, and I'm really glad that, uh, that you raised the, uh, the question here, but particularly for those new entrants and those uh, young and beginning farmers, uh, uh, land access and land affordability is, is absolutely paramount. And um, it, it's been an issue for uh, a number of years, obviously, and uh, uh, I think we're all continuing to look for uh, what is probably a whole collection of solutions um, in this process. But, um, but I think that there are a few things that we can continue to look at. Uh, there are some states uh, through their Department of Agriculture uh, and their state legislatures uh, that have been creative uh, in finding ways for uh, perhaps uh, retiring or farmers, farmers who want to make that transition, creating incentives and, and reducing some of the barriers uh, that currently uh, exist out there to allow these uh, uh, young farmers to, to come into the business, perhaps without that overhead. I think that this other question that you raise about uh, those who are uh, farming on rented land uh, is, you know, raises a lot of other questions, and that is, I, I've brought it up a number of times here, but I think Zippy and I are proud of the work that the Food and Ag uh, Climate Alliance has done. On the question of, of um, rented land, oftentimes there are disincentives for folks to participate in some of the conservation programs, and so whether we're talking about new and beginning farmers and those looking for land access, or those who currently rent land, uh, uh, making sure that we're f f finding solutions to all those challenges. Zippy? One, and one of the things, I think it was in the recommendations of the FACA is that, that we increase the, the loan, lending limits at USDA on the, uh, new, uh, the young and beginning farmers uh, because a lot th those limits uh, doesn't really, uh, aren't, aren't reality of what it would cost to try to go into business. And it would be an extremely small farm if, if limited to the limits they have on it. So, uh, and it goes, uh, farm, land ownership is a discussion that farmers have among themselves and it crosses a line of private property rights and who should be able to tell me whether I can sell it to the highest bidder regardless of where they come from is a big debate but but we should as a country be concerned about who's what the ownership is of our farmland because it goes back to who's actually feeding us. Absolutely. And I would say, especially in Hawaii, where we are very land limited, this is a big issue for us as well. And I know I'm running out of time, but I would put out there that my concern in a state that's hit by drought, flooding, wind damage, volcanoes, I am concerned about current disaster aid programs and federal crop insurance actually being effective. Is it makes sense for farmers, given how some of the reimbursements are done? Sometimes it's not a disaster declaration, but it's a disaster for our farm. So I think we have got to make sure we're flexible and nimble enough to make sure we take care of those who take care of us. So thank you for being here, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlelady. Now please recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Kamek, for four minutes. Hello. <laughs> we didn't quite make it to her chair. Whoops. Uh, 
Okay, can you hear me? Okay, they've got us packed in here like uh, sardines. Um, as the lone Republican representative for the Sunshine State, I can't believe I'm doing this standing, Mr. Chairman. This is a first. <laughs> um, we are faced with a couple of unique issues. Uh, as so many of you guys know, Florida is home to 300 specialty crops, and one of the things that is particularly concerning is the fact that we don't have a seasonal or perishable provision as part of the USMCA agreement. I'm hopeful that we can rectify that in the upcoming Farm Bill. And I know we've had a lot of discussion today, very productive about the regulatory, uh, I'll call it regime, because to me that's really what it is. I'm going to go down the line, give you each a crack at your favorite regulation, minus WOTUS, because I think everybody wants to take WOTUS out. But uh, while I'm, while y'all are thinking about that, I do want to highlight that um, as, as one of the token millennials in not just this committee, but in Congress, uh, as someone who grew up in agriculture, it is very concerning the fact that we do not have um, that next generation really primed and ready to go because it was such a high barrier to entry. So uh, I do want to <coughs> highlight the fact that I think there's opportunity for us to work on streamlining some of these projects and, and programs. And with that, I'll start with you, Mr. Duvall, your favorite regulation that you'd like to see taken off the books and why? The regulation around, uh, around guest worker programs and what we had to go through to get the labor that we need to get our farms. Uh, operated and stay sustainable. Things like adverse wage effect, housing, transportation, that whole gamut. And the list goes on and on and on. It's almost like you're making the case for a new guest worker program to be housed under USDA. You took the words right out of my mouth. <sighs> uh, the hodgepodge of truck weight regulations around the country, you cannot drive a truck across the United States. Mm -hmm without stopping and getting new permits and revising the number of axles on your truck as you move across. Would you say 88,000 pounds would be the truck weight that would be acceptable for interstate commerce? Why don't we do what Canada does and has for years, and Oregon and Washington and many states, 105,500 with an extra axle, the truck brakes faster, slower, faster and straighter All right. under our current law. Perfect, thank you. Well, NEPA seems like the easy one, but I'm going to go with the Florida one and say phosphogypsum reuse. Okay. And if you don't know what phosphogypsum is or that we have to stack it as the only country in the world, somebody else can ask that question next. Excellent. Thank you. I would say regulations around energy and the use of renewable fuels and um, um, maintaining a um, kind of all of the above energy policy. Okay. I would say... I would say the GIPSA rules and contracting, I hear so much about consolidation. Our industry is uh, the top four. Mm -hmm. If I took half of our industry, added 15 more companies to that, we still wouldn't hit that margin. And I hear about concentration, and I think about it, and maybe the only way it'll resonate with some people is this way. You want a job in high tech, you go out to Silicon Valley. You want to be a movie star? you go to Los Angeles. You want to get in the chicken business, you can do it in over 30 states in America. <laughs> so please join us. Never heard that one before, but that's smart. I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll stay on this theme, but actually flip it around and say that the existing regulations right now in the Packers and Stockyards Act are what need to change. Uh, they limit individual farmers um, and growers' abilities to challenge deceptive practices, to challenge ret retaliation, and uh, for competitive injury and harm uh, uh, within this consolidated market, uh, individuals have to prove harm to the entire industry. Nobody who wants to seek remedy should have to go through that. Therefore, we need to change that. So f suffice it to say that the regulatory regime is killing agriculture as a whole and it needs to change dramatically, correct? Let the record reflect that every single one of the witnesses is shaking their head yes. <laughs> I yield back. All right. Thank the general lady. We uh, we're going to keep going here, but we will be, uh, because of the interest of members, which I really appreciate. And folks come back, and we will recess at some point. We just have two votes, uh, so go, and um, but we're not going to recess yet. We will keep going, and I'm pleased to recognize uh, my friend and the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Carball, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My staff challenged me to walk up the stairs, this old Marine, to remind me that those were a long time ago when I served in the Marine Corps. 
Um, since 2019, my colleagues and I have worked in a bipartisan manner to address the workforce challenges that producers throughout the nation are facing through passing the Farm Workforce Modernization Act in the House twice. The Senate introduced a companion bill that would have provided much relief specifically to H-2A users dealing with adverse effect wage rate, AEWR, increases. This may have been the closest we've ever come in a long time uh, to seeing ag labor reform done in decades. Last night, the Department of Labor put out a final rule for AEWR. There's much discussion today about regulations that are causing harm to farmers who are already dealing with the higher input costs, supply chain disruptions, and other issues on the topic of inflation. Mr. Duvall, not to pick on you, but my question to you is, why did the farm, the American Farm Bureau Federation not support the bipartisan effort to pass the Farm Workforce Modernization Act at the end of last year, which would have superseded the provisions of the recent AEWR rule and provided farmers with much relief on the labor front through a modernization H-2A program. I know many of the farm bureaus, the, the largest state, ag producing state in, in the nation, California, supported it. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce supported it. Uh, the farm workers, uh, UFW, supported it. So I was, to be quite honest with you, just quite baffled why we couldn't get over the line with the U.S. Farm Bureau uh, supporting it as well. So we have a serious problem with AWAR and and the, the, the uh, formula that they used to set that, even though we were in favor of them freezing it, that was a good intention to freeze it for one or two or three years or whatever it was. We don't think that was enough. We think that the AWAR needs to be reformulated and done, make it fair to the worker and make it fair to the uh, employer. And no one size fits all. The, all of the country is different and it should be handled differently. The second thing is uh, 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 private right of action. Uh, the, that bill gave uh, a more, put farmers at more risk and more regulation than it was before. Uh, the third thing is it allowed for year-round workers, and, but it had a cap of, I think it was 20,000 on it. There's 100,000 jobs needed in just dairy alone today. So we didn't have a problem with having year-round workers, but we did have a problem with the cap being there. And then we need to be assured that uh, that we have a guest worker program in place and have it have it uh, successful and run multiple years before we're asked to do e-verify and e-verify as most people know there's a lot of undocumented workers that work in agriculture uh, those undocumented work workers have probably been in a lot of these communities for 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, need, needs to be some way to allow them to stay here and continue to work in agriculture. Thank you. Um, I would just say that I too believe in Santa Claus and I too want perfect legislation out of Washington, but sometimes that's the enemy of good. And I think that was a good bill and it was an unfortunate loss of an opportunity. Um, Mr. LaRue, you noted that President Biden's executive order and USDA actions have minimized supply chain disruptions by increasing capacity at ports. Can you expand upon how these legislative initiatives have benefited shippers of U.S. grown agriculture commodities? I had stepped out for just a, a, a quick minute there. Uh, if you could uh, please, I realize that we're almost out of time here, but uh, I'm happy to follow up if, unless you want to Restate the question, I'm sorry. Feel free to just uh, send in your answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I'll yield back. I appreciate the gentleman. Uh, uh, my good friend from California, that we work closely together, I tried to play the role of Santa Claus um, and offer an amendment that was supported by the Farm Bureau that would have made some simple, um, and I supported that bill, knowing that it needed to be fixed for it ever to be, be able to go forward and um, offered an amendment. Unfortunately, we... It was done under a closed rule in the 117th Congress out of the House. And so I think we have some components that we can all work together to, because without workforce, we're going to, in agriculture, we're going to have food insecurity. Now, I'm pleased to uh, uh, recognize the uh, uh, gentle lady from Texas, uh, Congresswoman Dela Cruz, for, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting this important hearing today. 
Farmers today are facing more uncertainty than ever before. Production costs are on the rise and there are supply chain issues. Labor costs are up and on top of all of this, we have experienced record inflation. Look, it's clear that we need to get things back on track. In December, uh, Ag's econo Economy Barometer, published by Purdue, surveyed producers listed high input costs and rising interest rates as top concerns for farmers. Presidents Duval and Laru, can, can you speak to how these issues are affecting your members? Yes, the rising interest rate is causing, uh, uh, very, making it very difficult for our farmers to borrow the capital to uh, either improve their farms or buy new machinery, update the machinery, or even put get enough uh, uh, capital to put a crop in the ground. Uh, but when interest rates goes up, it is crushing to farmers and ranchers. Uh, and as inflation hits with, when it affects fertilizers and fuels, uh, that cost of production, that's the biggest cost that we have outside of labor, and it depends on what you're growing as well or not as fuel or labor is the biggest cost that you have. Uh, as inflation moves forward, uh, all that puts a, a big, uh, put a, puts our farmers in a bind too. And I'll refer to Rob. Yeah, no, I, I would, you know, echo much of what was uh, already said and just say that, that that affecting that impact, of course, is strongest on some of the smallest uh, to medium-sized uh, farmers and producers out there and those families uh, that are really struggling with very thin margins. Uh, but it's also, we, we've made reference to the young farmers and beginning farmers and so forth, and so any additional cost and impact, you know, has really a, a damaging effect. That cost and that inflation also impacts everything, you know, or a lot of the programs at USDA in effectively diluting the impact, whether it's a cost share program or something like that, something like that, that has impacts uh, in raising the cost of everything and creating a bigger gap between what a farmer has to uh, contribute to uh, for those increased costs. So are you finding that your farmers are, are actually sowing less? So that means perhaps in the future there won't be as much that they are yielding as far as crop is concerned? Oh, I would always say that Farmers and ranchers, you know, are some of the most innovative and, and creative folks out there, right? And so if they can produce and they can manage to produce even more, uh, but when you have these higher costs, I think it does have the uh, kind of dampening effect of, of uh, keeping that innovation at the same rate. Excellent, thank you. Now, not long ago, America was the largest energy producer in the world. Um, oil and gas, I'm from Texas, so those are two important resources there. The raw materials um, for diesel fuel were abundant and, and affordable. However, through the Biden administration, um, they have paused significant domestic production of oil while limiting and disincentivizing investments in American energy, infrastructure, and uh, uh, refining capacity. Um, uh, President Duval, how has the Biden administration's energy policies affected agriculture producers' access to reliable and affordable supply of diesel fuel? Yeah, it, it has tremendously affected it, and, and uh, just like we were talking about, it really goes right down to the bottom line of our farmers when they have to pay more for it. Uh, when we were energy independent, uh, and uh, I, I'm proud to say that agriculture played a major role and played their part in ethanol and, and biodiesel production off our farms. Uh, 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 our, our country was stronger, our farmers were stronger, and we had a, a better chance to be sustainable. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, General Lady. Uh, votes were called about six minutes ago, and so we're going to hear from one more member, and then we're going to recess for anyone uh, Encourage folks to come back, uh, 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 but we're going to hear from one more member. So I'm pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Washington, Congresswoman uh, Glusenkamp Perez. Thank you, Mr. Members. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you to all of our witnesses um, for being here today. Uh, President Larue, as you may know, I'm a big advocate of right to repair legislation, <clears throat> and that's not just because I fix cars for a living. Um, I know that this is not just about cars and tractors. <clears throat> It is actually about our DNA as Americans. We believe in fixing things. DIY is part of our DNA. And, and so I was very pleased to see your testimony at the National Farmers Unions uh, 
supporting the right to repair. I'd just like you to elaborate and explain in the real world, world terms how this trend of us not owning the things we rely on, not having the right to fix our own stuff, is affecting farmers and our food security. Yeah, I appreciate you raising that. And quite frankly, I appreciate your, uh, your leadership on, on this issue. And, uh, I, you know, as you well know, uh, as a uh, auto mechanic yourself, um, and uh, uh, farmers uh, like that independence. They like to be able to, uh, they like to innovate. They like to be able to repair their own equipment. And so as manufacturers have uh, increased uh, the capabilities uh, of the machinery, that comes with a lot of complexity uh, in equipment and so forth. But along with it has come really big restrictions on uh, farmers' ability to either fix it, uh, seek independent repairs, or to access even the diagnostic equipment in some cases. And what we've come up with is a patchwork, uh, unfortunately, of approaches and uh, MOUs and promises in the past uh, that have never actually led to any concrete resolution to this issue so that farmers can uh, handle their own equipment. The real uh, world impact that this has is delays and the theme of this uh, uh, hearing is added cost. Um, this is about uh, creating additional burdens and ultimately affecting the bottom line uh, for farmers uh, out there all across the country, either through the delays, either through because of that control of the uh, repair and the parts uh, at a cost uh, that's built into uh, really also in a monopolized uh, equipment manufacturer's world. We hope that there will be a solution out there. We know that uh, states are addressing this issue and we've seen parallels uh, with the auto industry where uh, promises by the industry have not led to the solution but efforts uh, to uh, put that uh, right to repair into law has that added effect of making that accessible to everyone. Yeah. Would you say that these um, policies are increasing costs to the consumer for our, for our? Of course. Anytime that there's added costs uh, raised into this, that has to be passed along uh, somewhere. And, and what about the impacts on labor and the growth of independent you know, kids thinking about entering the trades or... Um, you know, the accessibility of, of owning tools to open up your engine? Well, I think that there are two uh, issues there. One of these is, is this question around independent repair, uh, right? And the fact that, you know, one of the other themes from this is the impact that uh, added costs and restrictions on farmers and ranchers is that that has a ripple effect through our rural communities. Um, and part of that effect is that small businesses that may be uh, able to offer uh, uh, repair or to provide some services are currently limited in their ability to do that. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, another issue that is critical to my state is that of trade. Washington State's agricultural economy is highly dependent on trade. Um, we are one of the largest exporting states. Uh, according to the USDA, Washington ships $4 billion in domestic ag abroad annually. Um, so uh, th this uh, fruit tree growers in Washington state have lost more than 800 million in exports to India and China because of these countries' retaliatory tariffs. And that puts our growers at a disadvantage when competing against growers that enjoy preferential treatment. Um, with that, I will yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank the general lady. The, the committee will stand in recess subject to the call of the chair, which will hopefully be within 15 to 20 minutes. So.
All right, if we can ask the uh, witnesses that may be in the room, uh, uh, please go ahead and take your seats. We've got a couple members here and we'll... No problem. On the seat. Well, I appreciate everybody's patience as we uh, uh, continue here. Uh, and uh, pleased to recognize uh, a gentleman, a neighbor of mine, actually, from New York, uh, Congressman Langworthy, for, um, for four minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and as many of my colleagues have already mentioned, one of the key drivers of skyrocketing prices facing our farmers and our ranchers, including a lot of the small family farmers in my district in western New York and the southern tier of New York along the Pennsylvania line, is energy. And my district sits on top of the Marcellus Shale, and it's considered one of our nation's largest natural gas resources. Yet Democrat leaders in New York State and here in Washington have made it their mission to forever lock away this game-changing source of American energy. The result of these policies, there are producers who are struggling to survive, struggling to afford the fuel they need to run their trucks and their equipment. The energy crisis facing our farmers is leading towards a food crisis. And if we want to get serious about ensuring the future of American food security, we need to get serious about unleashing the power of American energy. <clears throat> and with that, um, President Duvall, as you know, this administration has struggled with implementing an effective energy strategy. And I agree with others on the panel that Congress and the Biden administration should avoid any policy that seeks to halt or hold back increased domestic energy production. And regarding inflation, energy costs couldn't be any higher. For example, the average price of diesel per gallon in 2020 was 250 a gallon. And since that, it has increased to around $5 a gallon. Uh, President Duvall, how are your members adapting to and managing high energy costs in their agricultural operations? Well, we previously referenced it a little bit. You know, I think a lot of our farmers and ranchers are uh, putting a pencil to the crop that they're planning on crop, uh, planting, and it could change what crop they plant, or it could even make their mind up not to plant it at all if, if the uh, cost of production is going to be more. Uh, than what they're going to reap out of it. So I, I think it's just one of the things that's in a formula that they go through to decide what and, and whether they're going to plan it. Plan it. Great. Uh, Mr. Twining, in, in your testimony, you mentioned a study that your association conducted regarding potential scenarios of transitioning to electric light duty vehicles through 2050. Uh, I come from a state that's looking to enforce a transition to all electric vehicles and move away from natural gas and other affordable fossil fuels by 2050. Uh, speaking with farmers back home last week as we were on district work period, uh, this is something that weighs very heavily on all of our producers. Um, they, they don't know, you know, they have great uncertainty on how they're going to comply with these, these goals that have been arbitrarily set by our state government that may not be achievable at all. 
while at the same time we have an administration that is crippling our energy sector you know, with policies here in Washington. Uh, so what are some of the challenges from moving an agricultural operation to all electric by 2050 and moving away from natural gas and fossil fuels as a whole? Is this a timeline that you see as even remotely possible? Well, I definitely encourage you to refer back to the written testimony for the details, but I can tell you practically on a daily basis, the type of equipment that most farmers and ag retailers like ourselves operate cannot be successfully operated currently with existing electric technology. And uh, more importantly, there's far better bridge fuels and renewables that lower our carbon footprint and enable us to continue to do business as normal with existing equipment, which lowers our cost. Uh, so to leap to electric is um, uh, premature, in my opinion, and, um, and overlooks an a, a important intermediate step we could take that does bring climate benefits with it. Thank you very much. And, and one, one separate question for President Duvall on a different topic. I know that you've been engaged on the right to repair issue, and just quickly, I was wondering your membership's thoughts on that. Yeah, well, well we would love to have a... Uh, a solution within the industry, and that's why we've worked real hard with John Deere, and we have a memorandum of understanding that allows us to work on our equipment, take it to our local dealer to provide, they'll make uh, give us access to the tools, but it is just a memorandum of, of understanding, and hopefully uh, we're working real hard to do that with other manufacturers, uh, but if that doesn't work, then we're gonna be looking to y'all to help y'all help us solve that problem. Uh, and, and we'll be revisiting it to be able to monitor it and see what that's working. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, witnesses. Thank the gentleman. Now, please recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for four minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for, I'm sure, has been a long day on the Hill, but we have a lot of work to do, gentlemen. Uh, this committee is charged with an incredible uh, opportunity and responsibility. Uh, it is a farm bill term. I know you all know this crystal clear. Uh, when I look at uh, what we're responsible for, I think about in Central Florida where I represent uh, so many ranchers and uh, citrus growers, farmers of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, who are counting on us. And also many folks, whether in our urban or rural areas, uh, who are availing themselves of SNAP as well and uh, in some of our suburbs. Uh, and so as we all work together, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure uh, that we keep this critical coalition together. Just uh, speaking to some of my constituents at home briefly, so many of our ranchers are going to need uh, to continue to have the vaccine bank to help out with livestock, um, specialty crop investments for citrus greening are going to be important, um, preserving seasonality uh, for our fruits and vegetables growers who uh, are providing so many nutritious fruits and vegetables uh, during the winter time. And then so many areas around the district, whether it's rural, whether it's urban, and even some of our suburban areas that are uh, desperately need uh, to make sure to have SNAP so no child in Central Florida goes hungry. And boy, did we have a roller coaster during the 115th Congress. We had a, a great bill passed out of the committee, then it failed once or twice on the floor. Uh, and then uh, it took us uh, until the end of the 115th to finally get it done. And uh, of course, we worked with our, our senators as well and, and finally got a product that we got through. Thank goodness and thanks to a lot of work by everybody by, in the 115th Congress. Um, President Duval, how key is this partnership between our farmers, ranchers, and growers, uh, along with SNAP and other food assistance to ensuring we pass a, a farm bill. How key is this partnership? Well, of course, uh, you brave men and women that serve us in these capacities have to answer to your constituents. And a lot of the, the, the people that serve in your positions don't come from agricultural areas. So they don't have an understanding, don't have a need to understand. And, and uh, it is important that we understand how important the safety net is for agriculture so that we will have the food to be able to use in the safety net for the people that are uh, not as fortunate as others during that, that period of their life. So uh, I think they go together well. It, it gives us a true picture of the food, where it's produced and where, it's, where a lot of it is consumed and making sure that those people have access to good quality food. 
And I'm glad you mentioned that, President Duval. Uh, not only is it a coalition to pass the Farm Bill, but so many of Florida's farmers, ranchers, and growers are helping supply the food for the SNAP program. How important it is, is it that we continue that partnership to put our local agriculture to work for the SNAP program? And how important is it for outreach for members of this committee to make sure our whole coalition understands this partnership? Well, it's important to all agriculture, but it's really important to the small, medium-sized farm that's looking for a local market. They may supply the local school with with those fruits and vegetables or whatever it might be. And, and I just think that and that's the partnership everybody desires to have. We live in an era where everybody wants to know the farmer and they want to know how they produce his food. And what better way to do that and do it local? Uh, of course, we can't feed everybody in America and everybody out around the world that way. Uh, but, but it is a, uh, uh, a market that uh, flourished during the COVID uh, pandemic. Well, thank you so much, Neil. Back. Thank the gentleman. Now I'll recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Congresswoman Miller, for four minutes. Thank you. President Duvall, in your testimony, you mentioned that receipts for major row crops such as corn and soybeans are expected to fall. How do you think new trade agreements could improve the situation? Anytime the, 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 the field in, in the arena of trade is leveled and we have access to those markets, it helps our farmers and ranchers uh, 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 tremendously. So uh, we, we're all the time working to encourage trade across, across the country and across the world. And we just think there's some great opportunities out there, especially in the uh, uh, Asia Pacific areas. Uh, and, and, and hoping that we will get around to doing that because we feel like this administration just hasn't moved fast enough in that area. I was going to ask you if you thought that this administration was passive or aggressive, so thank you for sharing that. And Mr. Rosenbush, in your testimony, you note that natural gas accounts for between 70 to 90 percent of ammonia production costs and that natural gas prices doubled in 2022. You also note that we need energy policies that support an abundant, safe, and affordable supply of natural gas. Do you think the Biden administration has taken necessary steps in supporting domestic production of natural gas? So we, we obviously support anything that will allow for natural gas to, capacity to increase. And I think that you can turn to my colleagues at the Ener Energy uh, Association, such as API, et cetera, to give you a roadmap of what exactly those energy producers do. But fossil fuels are, are a critical part of food and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to be more aggressive at allowing our gas producers to expand production. Uh, would you share some policies that you would like to see prioritized by Congress in order to promote natural gas production? Well, like I said, I would probably turn to my colleagues that are representing the natural gas producers. They're going to be the experts on that, but I could generally just say that some of the similar things we've talked about today around permitting, uh, expansion of, of uh, opportunities to expand natural gas production, but I think it's also signaling and, you know, we were talking about uh, electric vehicles and, and phasing out of gasoline vehicles. And I think uh, you know, those kind of messages also sound strong and we need to just make sure we have strong energy production, energy policies for agriculture. I agree. I agree absolutely. My husband and I are producers and we're very concerned about this. Under the Biden administration, we have seen record inflation, rising input costs, and a decrease in American energy production. My fellow farmers are concerned that the Biden supply chain crisis, inflation crisis, and energy crisis threaten the very existence of the family farm. Farm income is decreasing while consumer prices hit record highs. China is taking advantage of us, and we must unleash American energy, including biofuels, to fight back. I appreciate our witnesses coming today to advocate on behalf of production agriculture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman, and I yield back. Now I thank the gentlelady, and I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Molinaro, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate it. I thank uh, all of you for uh, uh, spending the day with us. Uh, it speaks uh, obviously not only uh, to the important work of the committee, but uh, uh, obviously how important we uh, we feel agriculture remains, uh, not only to food security, but national security. So send, we, we appreciate you. Um, 
uh, being here. I want to localize uh, one of my questions, and then I just have one other, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I represent a part of the state of New York uh, where fa family farms remain the largest industry, but also uh, where we continue to feel the pressure of uh, out-migration from metropolitan areas, putting a lot of pressure on uh, uh, a lot of pressure for su uh, subdivisions and, and higher cost of land. Uh, I also, of course, uh, serve uh, uh, and represent New York State, which um, I, I, I think California might give us a run for our money, but, but uh, still perhaps is uh, among the most overregulated states uh, in America. Uh, most recently, uh, as you likely know, uh, New York began its tr uh, transition to a 40-hour overtime threshold for agriculture workers, uh, despite pleas from uh, uh, area farms and farmers across uh, New York already struggling under uh, inflation and high cost of uh, uh, doing business. I know this is a, uh, a state issue, but, uh, but, but obviously has major impact on, on farming and agriculture. So members across the New York State delegation uh, have put forward legislation to try to uh, claw back that uh, imposition uh, and of that overtime threshold, uh, and we're hopeful we can take uh, some corrective uh, action. Mr. Duvall, I just, uh, um, although I did want to call you Zippy just because it felt good, that's fair enough. Um, uh, Mr. Duvall, um, could you just speak, uh, uh, maybe broadly, but uh, if you'd like to speak specifically to the New York ex experiment, uh, um, uh, about uh, access uh, to uh, to workforce, what the threshold uh, lowering the threshold will do uh, to to family farms and potentially uh, hurt farms uh, in New York State, and maybe to the benefit of other states. If you have if you have an observation in that regard, sure. Well, you, you know, when you start talking about overtime with farm workers, it's a different conversation than it would in most uh, production of anything else because we're uh, we are uh, driven by the weather and the elements outside. And one week we may be full speed ahead doing the work. We may be in harvest. We have to get it harvested or planted, and you gotta, you gotta go long hours to get it done. And then the next week it may be raining. You might not do, be doing anything. And overtime just really doesn't fit in the way the scheme would do things. And, and two, if, you, if, if a, far, a farmer's a businessman, and if you force him to play overtime, uh, a lot of farmers probably would say, okay, you've made your 40 hours, I'm gonna hire somebody else to come in and, and work the other part of the overtime. So it, 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 a lot of the workers don't like that. They wanna work, they don't mind working. Overtime. So emphasize that for me one more time. Uh, so the state of New York imposes the overtime standard. Workers don't like it. In fact, I've talked to many farm uh, yeah. workers who say, listen, I came here to make money, not, to, not go on vacation. Uh, what does that mean uh, for New York farms? Yeah, it means, it means that uh, it, the, there's already a shortage of help, so finding somebody else that would work in another 40-hour slot would be difficult. Uh, but that, uh, uh, but uh, when crops need to be harvested, they have to be harvested. We can't wait or they'll spoil in the field. Uh, and, and so much of what we do is on a time, timely basis and have to be done. So it would put uh, farmers under a hardship and it would put their employer, employees under a hardship. So as much as I'd uh, like to speak, uh, Mr. Chair, about uh, the, the high cost of, uh, of land in, in states like New York, I'll, we'll revisit that, but, uh, but a broader consideration for land trusts in the, in the context of uh, purchase or transfer of development rights as a means of protecting family farms. You know, in a state like New York, we, we, we've got to patch together small farms in order to make large farming work, and using tools more creatively is of, of benefit uh, to us. I won't uh, belabor that. Uh, Mr. Brown, I'd just like you to know that uh, the 19th Congressional District of the State of New York is is the birthplace of the chicken nugget, which I'm told is still chicken. <laughs> well, uh, sir, as somebody from Sing Sing, New York, the town, not the prison, and having gone to school upstate in Rochester, I'm well acquainted with New York, and I'm a New York Giants fan. As am I, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield. <laughs> Mr. Moore is recognized for five minutes, or four minutes, pardon me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not a New York Giants fan, but that's, other than that, I'm an SEC football fan. So uh, first, let me say thanks for, to the witnesses for all being here. Guys, we got committee hearings going, so we're all over the place. Zippy, good to see you. Uh, first question, Zippy, you mentioned something earlier today, and I, and I was trying to track on scope one, scope two, and scope three. Somebody was talking about that. and. The, it's just frustrating to me in this committee. I'm reminded of what Ronald Reagan said. He said, the government's idea on the economy is when it's moving, you tax it. If it keeps moving, you regulate it. When it fails, you subsidize it. So today it seems like a lot of regulations have been the issues that we're addressing. So as we talk about consolidation, I, I think a lot of times government, we have our thumb on the scale and we cause a lot of the problems. But can you elaborate a little more on this consolidation because of maybe the, the ESG, the things that are being pushed on farmers now that uh, 
It's fairly new to some of us here. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, pressures on the farmers is every time when you put, put those regulations into to, uh, uh, and start enforcing them, my farmers have to spend money and time or hire con uh, lawyers or have to hire consultants to help them get it done. And the margin that we work on is so thin, we can't afford to do that if we even had the time to do it. None of us have the, uh, most of us don't have the expertise to get it done on our farms. So the middle and smaller farmers, it really challenges them. Every time the government says, hey, you gotta, uh, you gotta respond to this regulation, you gotta fill out this paperwork, it puts you guys in a tough spot. I it guess. puts them in a tough spot, movement toward uh, uh, demanding that we do certain things around climate, puts farmers in a position where they got to have different equipment to do it with and different uh, ways of doing that farming. They can't afford to do that. And it just puts them in a very difficult thing. The American people love the farmer but they're, they're associated with a small, medium-sized farm. And of course, 98% of us are family-owned. They're not big corporate farms everywhere, but we're doing everything in our power uh, regulatorily to force that small, medium-sized farm out of business, and that's the opposite of what the American people want. Zibia, uh, my cousin just came back to our family farm. We hadn't been farming, hadn't been row cropping since 1980, and he was getting started. And he told me his input cost. He 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 budgeted for three dollars. I think he said three dollars and thirty cent a gallon for diesel fuel for this production season. And obviously, energy policies domestically have driven. They just blew his budget up between that and fertilizer cost. And so, um, it, it is something like I said. We we we. I think a lot of times our policies here cause bigger problems. And real quick, Mr. Brown, you know I'm an, a poultry science guy from Auburn from back in the day. And I think we used to hit about 90 birds a minute, and I think that was, a, you know, that was kind of a, a target. And so tell me now, this, the, the USDA, and how they're, you told me other countries are, are beating us basically in production of birds per minute now and line speeds. And so tell me, what are we facing, and what's, what's the holdup on getting the job done? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, the line speeds uh, typically for, for the chicken industry historically has been 140 birds per minute. Uh, back in the uh, 1990s, when President Clinton was in office, uh, USDA came up with a, a program called HEMP. It was going to be a trial program to see if companies that qualified could operate at 175 birds per minute. So that's been ongoing now since uh, about 19, uh, 1998. Um, then we had uh, some groups come and sue USDA and the industry about having this uh, line speed program. Uh, we went to court. We actually uh, joined USDA. Uh, USDA was supposed to come out of there and do a study on uh, whether this was safe or not. As I mentioned earlier, having been in place for well over 20 years now, almost 25 years, we have all the statistics that the food safety profile is equivalent to equal at the higher end and also um, uh, that the worker safety profile is equivalent. What's going on is we have the 175 waiver. We're likely, we could lose it to go back to 140 when other nations, Canada, Germany, et cetera, are at 220. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'll, I'll yield back. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, no problem. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I now recognize myself for four minutes. So, Mr. Brown, if you want to continue on there just a little bit, I'll give you a little leeway. Sure. And I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the click, Mr. Chairman, Dave, Mr. Rouser. Um, with regards to the to the gypsy rules that's in our testimony that we're uh, uh, you know uh, upset with is um, you know basically Congress never authorized these uh, gypsy rules uh, I think uh, Mr. Rouser as you know in fact in about 2010 during the first term of the Obama administration a trial lawyer out of Mississippi who made a living suing uh, chicken companies was given a job as a, an administrator at USDA. He crafted those original proposals. Uh, Congress forbade, forbade the administration from going forward on those rules. Uh, when they had a change of administration, they were not pursued by the Trump administration nor Secretary Perdue. We've now had another change of administration and they've come back. Uh, we hope that they never are enacted 
We are going to work with Congress, hopefully, to prevent them from being enacted. And if there's one son of a gun after 13 years that's sitting back, just licking his lips, waiting for these rules, it's the guy that wrote him, the trial lawyer in Mississippi, Dudley Butler. Let's deny him that joy. Mr. Rosen, uh, Bush, uh, uh, several of us were in a T&I uh, um, markup earlier this morning, and uh, we repealed uh, through a CRA, uh, got out of committee anyway, uh, a repeal of the uh, WOTUS uh, rule. And then also um, uh, passed legislation that I recently introduced, H.R. 1152, uh, the Water Quality Certification and Energy Project Improvement Act, uh, which uh, addresses the weaponization of the Clean Water Act, uh, specifically Section uh, 401. How big a problem, and you touched on this a little bit uh, before, but how big a problem is permitting in this country? And, and uh, if we get our permitting right uh, with clarity, transparency, uh, you know, easily enforceable and, and uh, conforming to the law, how much would that improve our ability to source back in this country? Yeah, it would be a huge impact. And I'll start with WOTUS to your comment. I mean, farmers and to build off what Zippy has said, they have been committed to conservation for a long time. And when you think about water and, uh, and nutrient use and using the four R's of using fertilizer at the right source rate, time, and place, um, tremendous improvements. As a matter of fact, 34.7% was one example of uh, nutrient use efficiency that a farmer in Illinois ha experienced uh, after using some of these um, practices. So we, we really need to be practical with these regulations both on the farm because we know farmers are doing the right thing voluntarily. Uh, and then from a production standpoint, uh, the permitting is key to, far, to uh, fertilizer companies being able to deploy their capital and assets quickly and efficiently. And, you know, they've got projects, they're ready to go. Uh, we've invested a lot in the energy transition. We're talking about how important natural gas is, but uh, low carbon ammonia is going to be a, a hot uh, investment into the future. And these kind of innovations are going to need streamlined um, streamlined permitting that will allow them to, to meet those innovation goals. Uh, Mr. Duval, real quickly, uh, you touched on trade a little bit. Uh, have there been any um, conversations with the administration about a trade deal with the UK that, have, that you've been involved in? I have not. I did have conversations with the UK last week, uh, and we talked about many things, but we also talked about trade. We have also, we have talked to the administration a lot about enforcing the rules of USMCA when it comes to corn going in Mexico and dairy in uh, Canada. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Duarte for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, I think abundance and affordability are inextricably linked. And yet we have regulation after regulation, land use limitation after land use limitation, um, energy constraints here in the country that are entirely resolvable. So, Mr. Brown, you, you li listed in your testimony that every American eats about 100 pounds of chicken on average each year. So it's a real round number we can work from there. Um, let's start and just tell a little bit of the other side of the story, at least one other side of the story on corn, ethanol, the price of feedstock for chickens, biofuels in general, and what, what are some of the biofuels policies doing to the price of chicken? Uh, well, sir, if you go back to when the uh, ethanol mandate was put in, I believe it was 2007 or 2008, that drove the price of feed, the price of corn through the roof. It knocked 13 poultry companies out of business. Oddly enough, you have people that advocate for ethanol, but they complain about consolidation. But we'll set that aside. So it drove the feed cost up. Now, over that time, our industry has taken narrower margins, and we've learned to live with it because, again, we're not going to refight that war. I don't think Congress would have the, ap the appetite for that. But it drives up costs. You drive up costs, that's less money for others within the industry. And it's cost, you know, if you're a grower, potentially less money, you're growing less birds. And if you're a consumer, you're paying at the meat counter. Thank you. And on top of that, you know, a chicken in every pot used to be a political kind of a proverb that was pitched upon by several politicians. 
Uh, we have a government that knows all about line speeds of chicken processing. Mm -hmm. We have a government that wants to pretend they know more than they do about chicken contracting and how chicken producers get to contract, make their own business decisions with, with companies you represent. I'll leave that alone, but I think it's self-evident that those are not putting chickens in every pot. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Zippy Duvall, how you doing? Long time since I seen you in uh, Tehama County on my property where we had a little WOTUS run around. That's right. Came out there with uh, Paul Wanger years and years ago. Th thank you for allowing me to do that. Back during the Obama era WOTUS rule, uh, Farm Bureau did a really good job of, of mapping and predicting what percent of American productive farmland would be impacted by the WOTUS rule. Have you done that again for the Biden WOTUS rule? Uh, we have done it in particular states. I can't tell you which ones they are. Uh, but if, if it continues to move forward, we're going to be doing more of that. We're really focused on what the Sackett ruling is going to say. Yeah, and, and this Waters rule actually has led to the criminal prosecution of farmers for farming their own land. Yes, sir. In production systems that have been farmed there before. Yes, sir. And uh, so the, the vagueness of the, of the Waters rule is, is a problem. Um, from the Fertilizer Institute, um, Mr. Rosenbush, we heard a few weeks ago in a State of the Union address that the President conceded that we would need fossil fuels for the next 10 years. Um, what is the fertilizer industry's plan to supplant fossil fuels as feedstocks to meet the uh, nation's agricultural needs for nitrogen fertilizers after that 10 years is up? I'm sure you have a plan. Well, great question, uh, Congressman Duarte, and, and I think we will continue to need fossil fuels uh, to support fertilizer supply. This is not a switch that you turn on and off. However, I will say that billions of dollars are being invested right now by manufacturers into low-carbon ammonia uh, production. So essentially, the ability to produce nitrogen fertilizers without natural gas and uh, whether it's electrolyzers or renewable fuels that will allow that chemical process that we call Haber-Bosch to occur uh, is, is something that's um, going to be invested in in the future. But that's not gonna happen today and tomorrow. And a lot of that may end up going into hydrogen um, fuel uh, for a, a source of fuel as well. So we will continue to need, to need natural gas and strong energy policy for fertilizer production. Thank you, I'll yield back to the chair. Well, thank you. I think that's uh, all of our members. Yeah. Uh, well, very much appreciated. Uh, everybody's uh, patience and your endurance, actually. And it's, uh, um, and quite frankly, um, you know, rural America, ag uh, the agriculture industry, and, and meeting the needs of every American family is uh, uh, well worth our endurance. And uh, so today's hearing, um, uh, just very pleased. We have 52 members that participated in today's hearing. I don't know if that's a record, but that's, um, um, uh, I think it probably is for the Agriculture Committee because we've we had so much interest, we've had to expand um, our, our committee membership here. And um, which I think speaks to uh, uh, the importance of this industry to the American families, and quite frankly, to a lot of families around the world when you think about our exports and our humanitarian aid that we provide through food. Um, uh, today's hearing has really shined a spotlight on many issues confronting producers and uh, the entire agriculture sector from the farm to the consumer, uh, whether it's market volatility, uh, weather risks, or wrongheaded government policy, much of which have been exacerbated by the Biden administration. The House Committee on Agriculture has a responsibility to examine these challenges and develop responsible approaches to addressing them in the upcoming Farm Bill. Over the course of the next several months, the committee will be holding numerous hearings and we'll be continuing our, our Farm Bill listening sessions at various locations uh, across the country. Uh, I'd like to challenge my fellow committee members to be present and heavily engaged in this process. Uh, getting the Farm Bill done right and on time will require a lot of work and attention from all of us, uh, but we owe it to all our constituents, from producers to processors and ultimately to consumers, uh, to get that policy right. So I want to thank the witnesses here today for their excellent testimony and responses to the, uh, to the members' questions. Uh, I do look forward to future hearings uh, and as well as uh, the next two listening sessions, uh, one in Fort Worth, on Thursday and one in a couple weeks uh, in Waco, Texas. 
Um, and then uh, with a lot more to be scheduled after that. And so uh, uh, under the rules of, uh, of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary re written response from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Committee on Agriculture is adjourned.